Welcome to the Australian Crime Show Series number 4. The first program we have is called D24 A Boy, A Horse and a Gun. D-24. From the files of the Victoria Police Department, for the first time, come these true stories of unceasing war against crime, of day and night vigilance that protects our life and our property, and of the nerve center that is the Police Information Bureau, D-24. D-24, D-24, calling car 17, car 17. Proceed to the corner of Union Road and Whitehorse Road, Baldwin. Investigate armed robbery. That is all. And here to introduce the first program in this authentic new series is Mr. Alexander M. Duncan, CMG, Chief Commissioner of Police for the State of Victoria. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Duncan. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moment, moments you will hear the first of a series of factual broadcasts. These programs have been designed to give you an idea of the work of your police force and to invite your cooperation in assisting us in our never-ending war against crime. Every police officer is a servant of the public, carrying out a multitude of duties that are essential to the order and the life of the community. We are proud of our record. It compares favorably with any other police force in the world. Our men and women are highly trained, diligent, and not lacking in courage. The area we cover is a vast one. Two and a quarter million people look to us to provide a 24-hour-a-day guardianship and the resources we have marshaled to that end are formidable. But if our task of protecting life and property is to be carried out effectively, we must have your cooperation. It is my sincere hope that these dramatic broadcasts will bring about a statewide recognition of the fine work of the police force it is my privilege to head, a realization that your police force needs and deserves your help. The events you will be told about actually happened here in your own state. In them you will find all the action, the excitement, the human interest that is the stock and trade of the writers of fiction. But they are all the more enthralling because they are true. That they will interest you I am sure and I am even more certain that they will convince you if that is necessary that your police force, the Victorian police force, is something of which you will be proud. We ask your cooperation, we want to proceed and progress in service to the public. We ask for it, but we are really entitled to demand it. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. And now, D-24. <laughs> The story we're about to tell you is true. We're presenting the case exactly as it happened. But because most of the people concerned are still living, all names have been changed. It's the case of a boy, a gun, and a murder. The constable on duty at the country police station of Warrigal could hardly have realized what a drama was about to unfold as early one morning in February 1945, a farmer entered the police station. Good morning, sir. What can we do for you? Good morning, Constable. I want to report the theft of a horse. A horse? Your name, sir? Uh, Jenkinson. Right, Mr. Jenkinson. If you'll give me some particulars. Well, uh, about a fortnight ago, a young fellow came to my place looking for work, you see. 
Well, he seemed all right, so I hired him. He was a good worker, too. By well, last Friday, I had to make a trip to Melbourne. When I came back last night, the horse was gone. So was the youngster. And do you think he took the horse? I don't know who else could have. All right. Well, first, we'll get a description of the horse. A saddle horse, bay. A bit long in the tooth. That's as good as I can describe him. And the young man? How old would you say he was? Oh, about 18, I suppose. Kind of sandy-colored hair. About my height. And his name's Johnson. Johnson. I think he's a Melbourne boy. I wouldn't be positive, but I gathered as much. Right, Mr. Jenkinson. I'll see that police headquarters in Melbourne gets the information. Oh, and one other thing. My 22 rifle. It's missing as well. Yes, it began as simply as that. A missing horse and a missing 22 caliber rifle. The constable at Warrigal forwarded his report to police headquarters in Melbourne, while the youth who'd taken the gun sought out a companion. Hi, Bill. Bill. You in there? Bill. How is it? It's me, Blue. Wait till you see what I got. Shh, don't wait, Mum, whatever you do. Climb in. OK. Here, hold this. Oh, 22, where'd you get it? I'll tell you in a second. <coughs> Relax, will you? Where you been the last few weeks? On a farm in the country. That's where I got the rifle. You got any bullets for it? Think I'd take a gun and not the bullets. I took a horse, too. You did? Sure, to make a getaway. I left him on the side of the road as soon as I hitched a ride to the city. You got a hacksaw anywhere? Oh, there's one in the shed, I think. What do you want a hacksaw for? For the rifle, of course. We'll saw off the barrel and the stock a bit, and we'll, we'll have a gun that's a good handy size. Oh, gee, Roy. What's the matter? You're going to do what we said, aren't you? I told you there's nothing to it. If we got a gun, well, we got one. You sure it's easy? Of course it's easy. Put a gun in someone's face and they're scared silly. They'll hand over everything they've got. But you gotta be tough. Remember that, Bill. You gotta be tough. Being tough helps. As the two youths proved to their own satisfaction a few evenings later. When Mr. Robert Clinton alighted from a tram at the White Horse Road terminus, Baldwin, and walked north along darkened Union Road. Just a minute, mister. Hey? Put up your hands. This is a stick-up. Hey. Now, look here. You know what's poking you in the ribs? A gun. That's right. A hand over your wallet. Here you are. Flash your torch out of here, Bill. Four quid. Got any more money on you? There's some change in my trouser pocket. Let's have it. He's got a wristwatch. Hand it over, mister. But... You heard him. Hand it over. All right. Look, you've taken everything. Put that gun away. Not so fast. Bill, that sports coat he's wearing looks about your size. You could use one, couldn't you? Yeah, I'll say. Take it off. You'll... You'll be sorry for this. Come on, off with it. Be careful with that gun. You can have the coat. There. Yeah. Thanks. Now, just stay where you are for the next five minutes. Let's go, Bill. Right, come on. Oh. Well, I'm dashed. Stay where I am. Let's see about that. There's a phone box in the corner. Uh, let me see. Police. The front of the book, I think. Police department. Here we are. Police city. F O two double four. F O two. Four, four.
police headquarters. Uh, I want D24. Yes, sir. One moment. D24. Hello. Hello, Clinton's my name. I've just been robbed at the point of a gun by two youths. Where are you phoning from? The phone box at the corner of Whitehorse and Union Roads, Baldwin. Right, Mr. Clinton. Will you hold the line a moment, please? Now the issue is squarely joined. A crime has been committed, and the victim has reported to D24, the communications section, nerve center of the Victoria Police Department. The machinery of law enforcement immediately moves into top gear. D24 calling car 17. Come in, 17. Car 17 here. Over. Proceed to the corner of Whitehorse Road and Union Road, Baldwin. Contact Mr. Clinton at phone box. He's just been robbed. I'll supply details as you go. Whitehorse and Union Road. I uh, got it. Hello, Mr. Clinton. Are you still there? Yes. You say you were robbed by two youths. Can you tell me what they look like? Well, it was rather dark, but they they flashed a torch once or twice. I, I think I'd recognize them again. How old would you say they were? Oh, quite young. Boys in their teens, about 18 or 19. Well, a bit younger, perhaps. One was smaller than the other. He was the one who was going to wear my coat. Well, they took your coat, did they? What sort of coat? A brown check sports coat. Had my initials sewn in the inside. R.E.C. Robert E. Clinton. What else did they get, Mr. Clinton? A wristwatch and, and about four pounds odd in money. Did you notice how these youths were dressed? Rather plain, coat and trousers. Uh, they were grey, I think. It was difficult to tell, but I don't think either had a necktie. Uh, and it was the taller one who had the gun. Right, Mr. Clinton. Thank you. A wireless patrol car will be there in a few moments. Thank you very much. D-24 calling 17. Come in, 17. Car 17 here. Over. Here are the details on that hold-up. Two offenders, both boys in their teens. Plainly dressed, coat and trousers, possibly grey. No necktie. The taller one is armed. They'll have in their possession a brown check sports coat, initials inside R for Robert, E for Edward, C for Charles. Also a wristwatch and money. Acknowledge when convenient. That is all. Union Road's just ahead. Well, there's the phone box. Ah, that'll be our man. The one without the coat. Mr. Clinton? Yes? Uh, police here. Hop in the car. Oh, thank you. We've been given a description of the youth who robbed you, Mr. Clinton. Uh, anything you'd like to add to what you told headquarters over the telephone? Uh, no, I don't think so. As I said, it, it, it's dark down Union Road. Now what about that gun, Mr. Clinton? Oh, the taller one had it. He kept prodding me in the ribs with it. Mm, pistol, was it? Uh, no, uh, it was too big for a pistol. Uh, it was a strange-looking gun. Mm. Sawn-off shotgun, perhaps? The barrel was fairly small. Would a shotgun have such a small barrel? A sawn-off pea rifle. I... Beg your pardon? Uh, what Constable Boyd means is that they probably used a 22 caliber rifle cut down with a hacksaw. A cut down 22 caliber rifle. Constable Boyd had hit upon the first important clue. And police headquarters knew that such a rifle had recently been stolen. The Warrigal farmer was contacted for further information about the youth who'd stolen his rifle. The following night, another hold-up occurred in Baldwin. 
The weapon used was apparently the same. The assailants were apparently the same. Patrol cars scoured the area, but the birds had flown. They'd switched their activities to Middle Brighton. Put up your hands. What? No nah, noise. Hand over your wallet. Oh, you can go to blazes, both of you. Hand it over. This gun's loaded. Oh, kids, you're nothing but a couple of kids. Shut your mouth. Get his wallet, Bill. Right. Uh, oh, no, you uh, don't. Look at him. Uh, 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 That'll teach him. Where's his wallet? Roy. Roy, look at you done. Shut up. You killed him. That's what you done. You killed him. Yes, the two young men had gone a step beyond robbery. They had crossed the threshold of murder. And now... D-24. The story we're about to tell you is true. We're presenting the case exactly as it happened. But because most of the people concerned are still living, all names have been changed. It's the case of a boy, a gun, and a murder. A few minutes after the fatal shooting in Middle Brighton, a woman telephoned police headquarters to report that she'd heard a shot and a man scream nearby. D-24 dispatched a patrol car to the address immediately. Who's there? Who is it? Police here. Oh, thank heaven you've come. I've been terribly nervous since I heard that shot. You are from the police. Senior Constable Norman, and this is Constable Crowley. Oh, hope you hadn't come for nothing. I'm certain there was a shot, and a scream, too. At least I think so. Well, you did the right thing in telephoning. It's better not to take chances, isn't it? That's right. Now, uh, from which direction did you hear the shot? Just down there. Would you like me to show you? If you don't mind. Just leave the door on the latch. There's a little lane down here, and I thought possibly... Oh, you'd feel silly if it was a, a car or a cat or something. Oh, don't worry. If they're all like you and reported anything suspicious, our work would be a lot easier. That's right. Here we are. This is the lane. Yeah. Flash your torch down at Crowley. We'll see if there is anything. Right. No, nothing there. Maybe on the footpath. <laughs> That's it. Mm. Look here. You'd better go back inside. No. No, no, I'm all right. Is he? I'm afraid he is. Looks as if he put up quite a struggle. Pockets are turned inside out. I say that there's nothing more you can do, and it's cold out here. Suppose you go inside now. We'll take care of everything. A man murdered. Practically at my front gate. Here, let me take your arm. You're not too steady. Thank you. Norman, look what I found here. What is it? A cartridge case. It's from a 22 caliber rifle. What do you know about that? I'd say it was the pair they're looking for over in Baldwin. You see this good lady inside. I'll contact D24. Right. I do feel a bit Car three calling D-24. Three calling D-24. Yes, three. At the Middle Brighton address. And it was a murder, all right. A man's been robbed and murdered. And we found near the body a 22 cartridge case. A 22? Right, stand by for further instructions. <laughs> The 
The officer in the control room at D24 switches off his microphone, reaches across and quickly dials a number. In another part of the building, the phone rings. Guthrie here. Inspector, there's been a fatal shooting and robbery in Middle Brighton. Car 3 is there now. And they've found a 22 cartridge case near the body. And the pair from Baldwin. Looks that way, Inspector. And those cars on special patrol in the Baldwin area, switch them immediately to Brighton. Yes, sir. When you've done that, check to see if we've had a report from the Warrigal Police Station. They were going to make further inquiries from the chap who had the 22 rifle stolen. I'll pick up that in the Brighton address on my way out. I'm taking over. And while D-24 sends out its call, switching the cars on special patrol in the Baldwin area over to Middle Brighton, Inspector Guthrie organizes the photographers and fingerprint experts. At the Information Bureau, another officer checks the files for the latest report from Warrigal. There's your report, Inspector. Oh, thanks. Hmm. Hmm. Excellent description of Johnson. I'd say it was a certainty he is the taller one of the two fellows we're looking for. You'd better put out this description to all cars. Yes, sir. Well, what's this? Jenkinson believes that he remembers Johnson speaking once or twice of a friend who lives south of the Yarra. Odd way to put it. Yes, isn't it? If you've got a friend living in Turak or Malvern, you'd say he lived there, not south of the Yarra. Unless Jenkinson heard it wrongly. Yes. But it, it could mean that Johnson comes from the north side of the Yarra, or perhaps all his other friends, bar this one, come from the north side. Hmm. I'll have to think that one over. It just could be the lead we're after. Minutes later, as the patrol cars and Inspector Guthrie link up at Middle Brighton, the two youths hold up another victim, two stations away at Hampton, taking from him a necktie, a watch, and a small sum of money. The man promptly reports to D-24, and another call goes out to the special patrol. D-24, calling Inspector Guthrie and the special patrol in Middle Brighton. Come in, Inspector. Guthrie here. Go ahead, D-24. A man near Hampton Station has just reported being robbed by two youths. One of them carried a knife, the other a gun, which might have been a sawn-off 22 caliber rifle. That is all. Well, what do you say, Inspector? Will we fan out around the Hampton Station? Uh, more than likely, the birds will have flown. I think it's time we were a jump ahead of them. Yes, sir, but how? Before too long, that pair will head for home. I think I trouble is, Inspector, we don't know where they live. I wouldn't say that exactly. What do you mean, sir? Well, we're reasonably certain that one of the two is the young fellow who was working in Warrigal as Blue Johnson. Johnson is supposed to have mentioned that he had a friend living south of the Yarra. At least, uh, that's the way we got it. It's mm -hmm. a mighty big place. There's mm -hmm. a lot of territory south of the Yarra, Inspector. Yes, well, uh, what I think Johnson must have said is that he, he had a friend living in South Yarra. There's a big family of Johnsons in South Yarra. Yes, but Johnson mightn't be the chap's real name. Well, even if it isn't, someone knowing South Yarra well might take the name Johnson. And I'm betting that pair from South Yarra or thereabouts. Mm. Yes, I think you're right. Well, what's our best chance then, sir? Intercept them on the way? That's it. I'll contact D-24. We'll have a car placed at every strategic intersection south to north. Mm. Uh, Norman. You and Crowley drive to Hampton Station and see if we can get any leads. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Boyd. Uh, yes, sir. Let's follow our theory to its logical conclusion. You and Simmons go to the South Yarra Station and keep a look out there. A hurried dash through the southern suburbs. One by one, the cars take up position. Report to D-24. The trap is set. Now the officers begin a tense vigil, eyes watching every motor car, every tram, every bus. 
and at the South Yarra Station. You've got to hand it to Inspector Guthrie. If those two are traveling this way by car, tram or bus, we ought to nab them. Should do. And if they're coming by train... Jim. Huh? Look. Coming out of the station. Two young chaps. Think they're the ones? I don't they answered the description. Car 17, calling D24. 17, calling D24. D24. Two youths emerging from South Yarra Station. Might be the ones. They're carrying a satchel. We're going after them. Just a minute, lads. Cops, shut up, Bill. What do you want? We'd like to see what you're carrying in that satchel. Why? We're looking for two young fellows who shot and killed a man in Middle Brighton earlier tonight. Open your satchel. Sure. Sure, I'll open it for you. This is what's inside. Copper, a gun! Uh, look out, you! Oh, no, you don't. Uh, Here, get the other one. Uh, 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 let go. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Not tonight, son. Uh, drop it. No. Drop it, I said. Uh, my wrist. Drop it. Uh, that's better. Hmm. A sawn off 22 caliber rifle, eh? What else is in that satchel? Oh, I ain't saying a word. Hey, you got the gun away from him, Jim. Good work. You got the other one? Yes. Nice type. He pulled a knife on me. I didn't pull it. Fell out of me pocket. Get in the car, boys. Keep your mouth shut, Bill. Don't think that's going to help. A necktie? Two watches and some notes in that satchel. They'll do the talking for you. You're both under arrest. The two youths were identified by the men whom they'd robbed. Ballistics experts proved that the gun taken from Johnson was the one which had fired the fatal shot. It was the same gun stolen from the farmer in Warrigal. Johnson was found guilty of murder. His companion guilty of robbery under arms. Both received long sentences. Another crime had been cleared up. To the police, it was all in the day's work. To you and me, it meant freedom from what threatened to be a long series of armed and tragic hold-ups. Full marks must be given for the police work in this case, especially to the officer who, unarmed, overpowered Johnson, knowing full well that the gun in the young desperado's hand had already killed once that night. It must be pointed out, however, that without the cooperation of the public, the police would have been powerless. The farmer who reported the loss of his rifle, the woman who heard the shot, the robbery victims themselves, had any of these persons failed to act promptly, Johnson and his companion might still be at large today, menacing your life and your property. Although the story you've just heard is factual and is produced with the full cooperation of the Victoria Police Department, in the interests of the families and relatives of the persons concerned, names, place names and dates have been altered. And now this is Roland Strong saying goodbye until the same time next week when we'll bring you another authentic program in this series, D24, which is produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. Next up, we have Is It's a Crime, Mr. Collins, which is a 1957 episode called Paper Bag. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. It surely is. 
After all, what would you do if a gang of professional killers broke up your wedding night? That's exactly what happened. We hadn't been married ten minutes when... Well, maybe I'd better go back a bit to when I first met Greg. You see, my husband is a private detective. I'm Gail Collins, and I'll be back in a minute to set the stage for our puzzling crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. Now, Mrs. Collins, what did you mean when you said a gang of killers broke up your wedding night? That's exactly what happened, Mr. Little. It scared the daylights out of me. I don't ever remember... Now, 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 just a minute. You were going to tell how you first met Greg Collins. Oh, yes, so I was. You kind of fell for that guy like the proverbial ton of bricks, didn't you, Gail? I certainly did. <laughs> I knew Greg was for me from the first minute he walked into my curio shop back in New Mexico. Greg's tall, lean, slightly on the western side. And I took one look at him and said to myself, this is it. I love that man. <laughs> After we'd met, Greg went to Mexico City on a secret assignment for the U.S. government. I guess you know he's a private detective. And a darn good one, too. Oh, you're right. But sometimes he does special jobs for the government. Greg called me from Mexico City and proposed over the phone. So I flew down and we were married. Then we ran to one of those dreamy honeymoon cabanas at the Hotel Dos Reyes. Well, like the man says, we're alone at last, Craig. Uh-huh. That's right, Gail. Well? I, uh... <clears throat> I think I'll take a cold shower. That didn't bother me. I knew Greg would be out soon, grinning like mad, having drowned himself in that Tweedy shaving lotion he knew I liked so much. So, Greg started to take his shower. And to sing. <laughs> I sprawled on the shades, feeling languid and Marilyn Monroe-ish. After all, Mother had forgotten to tell me what to do about gangsters who break up a girl's wedding night. But there I was on the chaise when... Yes? Who is it? Oh, one second. Yes. What did you want? Take... Take this. The paper bag? What for? Who are you? Now, look, Buster, if this is a gag because we just got married... Yeah, I was... Uh... Oh. Have we uh, visited... I don't know who he is, Greg, but I think he's awfully drunk. Take a bag. Look, I don't want your paper bag, and besides... Della I... Turner. Get to her quickly. Della Turner? What bag's there? Murdering. Murdering? And gang, where is it? Singing watch. I... Look out, Gail. Oh. Well... They certainly run this hotel nicely when an old souse can come into your cabana, play games, and pass out on the floor. He wasn't drunk, Gail. See? In his back. A knife? Let me have a closer look at him. Here. Take this bag he gave me. I don't want to touch it. Put it on the dresser. Uh -huh. He's dead all right. Did you hear what he said, Craig? Murdering Della Turner, wet backs, head ring, wear singing watch. I heard. Well, don't just stand there. Do something, darling. Do something clever. You're supposed to be a detective, remember? I am going to do something. What? Going to get dressed. Did he mean Della Turner, the famous actress? Sure. She's stopping here in town for Goodwill Day. She's playing over at the Teatro Australis. Is that where we're going, Greg? That's it. Now, let's see what's in that paper bag he gave you. Well, don't just whistle. What's in it? Popcorn? No. Pretzels? No. What's in it? A million dollars. Oh, it takes you so long to answer a girl. You... A million dollars? Just about. Well, I... I... What are we going to do? Me? You're going to find a clean shirt. You take a look at our friend on the floor, meantime. Tell me what you see. 
Well, he's kind of bald. Looks about 40, I'd say. Do I have to do this, Greg? Yes, go on. Don't be so squeamish. I'm not squeamish. I'm just sensitive, that's all. I'm the sensitive type. Go on. He has a funny mark on his nose. You know what happens when you wear glasses with a metal nose piece? Good. Now you're thinking a little. A little? Well, I like Hurry that. Up, Gail. Where's that confounded bow tie? It was in this dresser. He's bruised. Looks like he was in a fight. Look at my bow tie with the orange polka dots, huh? I'll go ahead taking inventory on our visitor. All right. I wasn't enjoying myself much anyway. Orange polka dots, huh? Uh, weighs about uh, 150 pounds. About five feet seven. Fingers have calluses on them. Well, let's turn him over and get a better look. <clears throat> I'll open his coat. And... Oh, I beg your pardon. What's the matter? What are you doing with his coat? Buttoning it up. Our friend is wearing nothing under his coat but underwear shorts. Maybe he was playing strip poker. Fancy overcoat he has. The label says Elite Fashions, New York. Well, here's your bow tie. Greg, what kind of danger do you think Della Turner's in? Do you think some gangsters might want to, well, to kill her? I don't know. I'd better get to that theater where she's playing and tell her what's happened. What are you doing with the money? I'll keep it in my briefcase. Let's get out of here. It's, it's our wedding night, I know. But if we don't reach Della Turner in the next few minutes... What do we do with him on the floor? It's not very neat to have a corpse lying around and the maid doesn't show up till morning. Wetbacks. Yes, Mr. Collins, what is a wetback? Lots of very poor Mexicans trying to make a buck sneak across the Rio Grande to work on the farms in California and Texas. Lots of crooked characters are willing to help them do it for cash. Especially if the wetbacks will bring a little marijuana or uncut heroin along with him. We... Wait, listen. What is it? Someone's outside, Greg. Let's call the police. We can't. We have to reach Della Turner before somebody knocks her off. She probably knows something about a ring that's smuggling wetbacks across the border. If we call the police, how do we explain this? We're strangers in town. Unidentified body in our room. We lose hours. Might never convince them. By that time, Della Turner might be dead. <laughs> Maybe that's the police. No. I think that's the gentleman who put a knife into our friend there. And I wouldn't like to take a chance on his meeting us either. Come on. There's back window. Uh, up you go. Um, up. Uh, run to the plaza to find a cab. Oh, great. Oh, what's the matter now? The nighty girl gets married. Her groom always carries her across the threshold. And what does mine do? He throws me out the window. Well, Gail Collins, this is your life. Keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a minute with more of the story. Greg and I dashed to the plaza to find a taxi. Well, he dashed. He and his college track medals. I puffed along a very unimpressive second. After about five minutes of frantic waving, we grabbed a cab. It was an easy 12 miles to town. Teatro Australia, Prano. Si, senor. Oh, we'll be entertained. He has the radio on. Aquí es la noticia oh, esta noche. Un cuerpo de hombre sin identidad se halla en cabaña del Hotel de los Reyes. Wow. Guchuchillo fue puesto en su espalda. What is saying, Greg? It's a news broadcast. Unidentified body found at the Hotel de los Reyes. Oh, Greg. In a cabana. A man with a knife in his back. La policía está buscando el señor y señora Collins. How do you like that? Señor First time in my life I ever heard my name on the air and I didn't know what he's saying about me. Translated, Greg. Wait. La señora tiene cabello negro, ojos verdes. Es muy hermosa. They're describing you, Gail. Black hair, green eyes, very pretty. That's on account of the room clerk. From the way he looked at me, any time you want to throw me over, Greg Collins, that room clerk's waiting to catch me at the first bounce. 
La señora tiene puertas muy guapas. También. They're saying you have beautiful legs, Gam. Well, of course they are. Turn off the radio. But they're reciting poetry about me. They... Turn it off. Oh, but why? That cab driver would hear it. He can get a pretty good look at us in that rearview mirror. <laughs> He's too busy going the wrong way. This isn't the way we went down to town this morning. You're right. This isn't the road to town, driver. You're going the wrong way. Oh, that is all right. I'm taking a shortcut. You wanted to save time, did you not? Uh, okay. Oh, oh my goodness. What is it? I just realized. The driver. He spoke to us in fairly good English. And how many cab drivers in Mexico City speak English that way? It doesn't mean he's a pony, though. He's stopping the car. Hey, wait a minute, pal. Oh, I wish we had a gun. I have a gun. But I'd have to use it myself. Now, the two of you, get out of the car. Come on. Yeah. I'll take that briefcase, Mrs. Collins. Oh, should I let him have it, Greg? Yeah. He... Thank you, Mrs. Collins. You gave him something, Gail. So now I'll give him something, too. Man, what a right you've got. There'll be no fights in our family. Yeah, we'll leave him there. Somebody will find him. I'll take back the briefcase. And now we'll borrow that cab of his. That little interruption may have cost us Della Turner's life. Yeah. Hop in. I'll drive. Do you know the way, Greg? Yeah, I think so. Well, we don't dare to stop and ask for directions. That police alarm for us must be all over town. I wish I could step on it, but I, I don't dare attract attention. Cross your fingers, Gail. Here we go. When we reached the theater, the performance was on. Greg bought two tickets, reserved seats at the box office. Then, instead of going in, he dragged me to the stage door. Could we please see Miss Turner? I am sorry, Miss Turner is on stage. Oh, jeepers. Now, look, if I give you a note for her, would you see that she gets it? Oh, see, si, senor, I can do that. All right, good. Here. And this is very confidential. So be sure that Miss Turner gets it, would you? No one else. Uh, si, senor. Uh, thanks. Come on, Gail, we'll go out front. What did you write on the note? I told her we must see her right away, that she's in great danger and that's very urgent. And I put down our seat numbers. Now, let's go. Don't go away. In just a minute, we'll bring you the climax of the case. Greg and I took our seats in the theater. Della Turner was just leaving the stage as we sat down. There she goes now. Greg! Oh, isn't she exquisite? Isn't that dress a dilly? This isn't a fashion show, pal. Someone's going to be killed any minute. Keep your eyes on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an important announcement to make. I am sorry to tell you that Mr. Desmond Monash, our very popular violinist, cannot play for us tonight. Oh. Mr. Monash had a most unfortunate accident. However, since this is Goodwill Day, we did want you to meet him, if only for a moment. He will be leaving for the stage tonight, but he has very kindly consented to come out on stage and say hello. Now, here he is, Desmond Monash. Oh. Boy, Greg. He didn't just have an accident. He must have been in a battle royal. Look at him. Face all bandaged, his arm in that slit. Gail, we have to get out of here. And now, on with the this show! This place isn't as healthy as I thought it was. Well, what do you mean? What's wrong? I just found out who the dead man is lying back in our cabana. What? Now, let's leave here. Oh, wait. There's that doorman. He's pointing at us. Uh, Mr. Collins? Yeah? Uh, here's a note, an answer from Miss Turner. Oh, thank you. What's it say? Uh, that part of the show must be over. She wants us to meet her right away at the Casino del Toro on Flora Street. An out-of-the-way place like that? Come on, you just keep the handle of the briefcase clenched in your hot little fist and be quiet. But, Greg... Quiet! And a happy wedding night to you, darling. 
The Casino del Toro was in a very sordid section of Mexico City. As we pulled up in front, it had begun to rain. Fix a horn, only take a second. Run into the doorway of the casino. Oh, Don't Greg. stand there, I can shift the hood myself. Hurry, Greg, you'll get soaked. Okay, okay. There we are. That does it. Now let's meet Miss Turner. casino was a rundown, loathsome place. The man we'd seen on the stage with a bandaged face and broken arm came up to us. Miss Turner is waiting for you in that room to your left. All right. Mr. and Mrs. Collins. That's right, Miss Turner. Uh, close the door, won't you? We're terribly glad to see you're still alive and well, Miss Turner. You've been very helpful, Mr. Collins. Sit down, won't you? This is Mr. Monash, our violinist. How oh, do? Your note was extremely interesting, Mr. Collins. Well, let me tell you the whole story, Miss Turner. When we were in our cabana earlier this evening... A man As Greg to told our story, time. I looked he around. Didn't know who he was. The room was very he dark, was just two flickering bulbs. Miss Turner was seated on a Give small, a discolored a sofa. The violinist, oh, his face and arms it. bandaged, leaned casually against the, the wall, staring at Greg. As the man said, Greg get to finished the story. Danger. Well, there's the briefcase, Miss Turner, with a million dollars in it. We've been terribly afraid someone would kill you, Miss Turner, before we got to you. I appreciate that so much. The last thing the man tried to say before he died was that the head of the ring wears a singing watch. Is that all, he said? That's all. And now, Miss Turner, when we were in the theater, we, I realized something. Really, Mr. Collins? You have a clue? Miss Turner, that man standing over there with his face covered up by bandages is not Desmond Monish, your violinist. Stay where you are, pal, whatever your name really is. I'll stand by this door. Oh, what do you mean? He's... A ring of smugglers who sneak Mexicans carrying dope in the United States has been using your theatrical company. Using my group? Yeah. Greg, how could they? Well, they probably wanted to get a man into the States, this time in a big deal. He's probably a courier for him, so they grabbed the real Desmond Monish, held him somewhere. This man took the violinist's place in your troop tonight after inverting a story about having an accident so he could cover his face. Are you leaving for the stage tonight? I plan to, you but... see? In another few hours, this man will be stepping off a plane in the United States. But... but the briefcase... Payoff money. Probably part of one of their deals on helpless human beings. They're a vicious mob. They often kill the wetbacks if they think they're liable to be caught and start talking. They've slaughtered a very great number. This time, with all this dough to get into the States, they wouldn't trust an ordinary wetback. They picked our boy here. Get away from that door, Collins. Don't be a boy scout. I see, Greg. The real Desmond Monash was held in our hotel. Tried to escape, grabbed the money, got stabbed, staggered into our cabana for help. We were the first door he could find. That explains everything but the singing watch. Did you say the head of the ring wears a musical watch? Yes. You mean, like this? On my wrist? She's... Look out! Monish has a gun! Stay where you are, both of you. And I'm sorry you learned so much, Mr. Collins. We didn't plan to kill you and your lovely wife, but now you made it necessary. I don't get it. Della Turner... Head but... of the ring, Gail. The distinguished actress. You're dating yourself, darling. You used to be big. Then she was a washout. You get desperate for money, Miss Turner? Besides, maybe your once fancy name and your acting troupe was a great cover for a racket. Mr. Monash. Yes, Della? You better dispose of them now. We've very little time. Our plane is waiting. I wish you two wouldn't leave, Miss Turner. Oh, I'd love to sit and chat with you, Mr. Collins, but we're rather late. And you and your wife are much too well informed. I'm an expert shot. It won't be very painful for either of you. Go on, Mr. Monash. We're losing precious time. I said I wish you wouldn't leave, Miss Turner. That girl! He has a gun! Oh, the light! Collins, shut them out! I can't see! By the door! Oh, it's the policeman! I will turn on my torch! Della, quick, the window! Greg! She's going out the window! Stop them! I'll get them! I'll get them! <laughs> Greg 
practically flew out the window, firing at Della Turner and Desmond Monash as he went. He winged Miss Turner in the shoulder and got a friend in the leg. Fifteen minutes later, we were all down at the police station. They locked up Della Turner and her crowd, and Greg and I thought we'd be hailed as some kind of hero and heroine. Instead, the friendly policeman read a list of charges against us. Greg was furious. Now look, officer, the basic civil rights... I am rights... sorry, senor. We appreciate what you have done, but you have also violated our laws. You knew the gentleman on the stage was an imposter, yet you did not report it. Yes, I told you ten times. I knew that because the corpse in Al Cabana had calluses on his fingers, the kind a violinist would have. Besides, the label on his coat showed he was an American. Then when they announced that Desmond Monish, the violinist, had an accident, and another guy walked on the stage all bandaged up, I knew it wasn't Desmond Monish at all, see? Why didn't you tell the police? Because it didn't have anything definite yet. I suspected Della Turner, but I had to make a sure hand. And I wanted the police to show up while she was talking. Greg, you must have rigged the horn of the cab. It didn't go off by itself outside the casino. You made a jam. Smart girl. When I fixed the horn, I purposely did a bad repair job, knowing it would go off again and attract attention. It did. Along came one of your goo-goo-eyed gendarmes, officer. Goo-goo-eyed? Yes, yes, goo-goo-eyed. That will make another charge against you, senor, insulting the police force. Greg, maybe you'd better be quiet, huh? Me? Quiet? I have a right to speak. You can't lock us up. It's a wedding night. You can't keep us in jail tonight. Can't we? Hey, cellmate. You across the aisle. Yes, Gail? Tell a fellow a secret, huh? What kind of secret? Where'd you get the gun to shoot out the lights in the casino? I took it from the cab driver when I knocked him out. Oh? Well, tell me one more thing. How about your assignment from the government? Well, that's what I was going to tell you. I just finished it. That was it. The government asked me to look into the wetback problem down here. What? Nice of the violinist to walk in and hand me the case on a platter, huh? Or should I say, hand me the case in a brown paper bag? That'll do. I don't want to hear any more about the case. You know, there was a case in Boston... That... Quiet! Fine wedding night this is. Me way over here, alone. Oh, sorry, chum, I didn't arrange the separate cells. Fine thing on my wedding night. Very fine thing. I... Greg, I've got an idea. Oh, well, what is it? It's based on the old-fashioned saying, money talks. Bribe him, Greg. Get him to put us in the same cell. It mightn't work. Why? Well, because we've been running around all night with a million dollars. But me? I have exactly a dollar and 49 cents. A dollar 49? You mean you left your money at the cabana? That's it. Well, well, we'll have to try it anyway. Yoo-hoo! Oh, officer! Yes, senorita. Oh, come here, officer. We want to talk to you. Moral of the story. Prices are very high these days, but you'd be surprised at what you can accomplish with a dollar forty-nine. <laughs> Footnote tomorrow for June Brides. If you're planning a honeymoon out of town, the jails in Mexico City are wonderful. Oh, just wonderful. In just a moment, we'll be back with you. We hope you enjoyed our adventure, The Brown Paper Bag. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For where there is crime and romance. There you'll find Mr. and Mrs. Collins. It's a Crime, Mr. Collins was produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. This show, coming now, is an old show called Charlie Chan, this episode is called 
The Frightened Giraffe The Incomparable Charlie Chan We proudly present the incomparable Charlie Chan in a new and exciting series. Join the famous detective every week at the same time as he combines the wisdom of the East and the science of the West in a dramatic chapter from The Adventures of Charlie Chan. Charlie Chan humbly bids you good evening and extend... Warm welcome. Honored sage Mencius wrote, Man who gambles all should not complain when he loses same. Tonight we meet criminal game in which stakes were death. Listen, please. Thank you. Night's adventure, The Frightened Shrop. Two weeks ago, Jimmy Dace was shot in a gunfight with the police. This afternoon, Charlie Chan and his number one son sit in the day's home. Chan, fat and benevolent, gently sympathizes with the dead boy's mother. Has been written, Mrs. Dace. Sorrow, like bad weather, in time will pass and be forgotten. Do not permit grief to monopolize thoughts. This abandoned person, so sorry to be cause of son's death. It wasn't your fault, Inspector. No, you did your job. You couldn't save Jimmy. He was dead already. Dead already? The day he started running with that crowd, he was lost. It was just a question of time. Heaven only knows how I begged him and pleaded. He wouldn't listen. Most unfortunate. What's good of you to come here? You're very kind. (laughs) You're the only visitor I've had since it was in the papers about Jimmy. Yes, I'm the notorious Mrs. Dace. They point at me and whisper. Great philosopher once said, any event, no matter how small, always produces large talk. Maybe. It's too much for me, the looks and the whispers. No one understands the heartbreak of a son gone wrong. This person understands and sympathizes, Mrs. Dace. You're the only one. I'm leaving San Francisco, Inspector. I've lived here all my life, but I have to get out and be a stranger somewhere else. This inept brain suspected such decision was a reason for visit. Do not run away, Mrs. Day. There is no escape. Remain in city. Your friends will return. You will restore purity to name in time. No, no, it's impossible. Crime and dishonor exist everywhere. You cannot escape must remain and continue battle here. Oh, that's the door. More reporters, I suppose. No, I'm leaving. I'm settling everything and going away. I have to. Yes? What is it? Message for Mr. James Dace, from Gregor's. Message for... Don't you know his... Oh, let me see. Come in. You are from Mr. Gregor? A reference to famous Schroff in business on Grant Street? That's right, mister. Schroff? Oh, what's a Schroff, Pop? This is an IOU signed by Jimmy for $50. <laughs> he couldn't even take his trouble with him when he died. He had to leave it for me. All right, here's your money. I've got it. In my... What's a Schroff, Pop? Schroff is oriental name for money changer, a bill collector and small banker. Here's your $50. I suppose I keep the note, don't I? That's right, ma'am. It's a receipt. Thanks. Ah. Oh, one moment, Mrs. Dace. 
Uh, may this person inspect IOU in hand? Why? What's the matter? Hmm. You recall this person's words? There is no escape from crime and dishonor. Here is proof. What? You have not paid son's debt, Mrs. Day. But, but... Uh, Observe uh, IOU closely. Note signature. Is composed of many short lines, as though sketched by artists. This experienced eye recognizes signature as freehand forgery. Golly, Pop. Come quickly, please. Inspector Chen. Your son dead, but you cannot escape, Mrs. Dave. No one can escape crime. You are involved in new trouble. Must remain and assist this person in solution. Yes, Inspector Chen. Mount Devil Wagon at once, son. Must find messenger who collected payment. That must be his car going down the hill. Hurry up, Pop. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hold on. Uh, I don't know what this new business is, Pop, but I'll catch that messenger for you. And sound horn, please. Indicate desire to overtake. I don't think he knows what we want. He's speeding. Golly, if he isn't careful, he'll pop. He'll never make that corner. He's skidding. Gosh, look! Oh. You want me to call an ambulance? Time for acceleration completed. Unfortunate gentleman, dead. You ought to have known better than tear down Russian Hill like that. Perhaps. Ah, there is dispatch case under car. Kindly bring same to father. Right. What's this all about, Pop? Explanations will follow. Uh, one moment. Ah. Golly. Look at all that money. Case. Contains over $500. Also three IOU notes. I don't understand, Pop. All signs indicate ancient confidence trick. Now in operation in San Francisco. Have a heart, Pop. Educate me. Unidentified criminal watches obituary columns. Lists names and addresses of defunct persons. Two weeks after death presents forged IOUs for payment. As they did with Jimmy Dace? Exactly. Usually, bereaved family too grief-stricken to observe ordinary business precautions. They just pay the dead man's debt, and that's easy money for someone. But how do they forge the signature? Extremely simple to obtain sight of departed person's writing from, uh, from files of telephone applications, driving licenses, voting lists, etc. Probably through rules of posing as a, a, a business investigator political organizer, and so on. It's a smart idea. And the most vicious victimizes persons in times of greatest tragedy. Must be stopped at once. How? What do we do? Proceed immediately to Office of Shroff on Grant Street. Was wise sage who wrote, No matter how black crime may be, its source is always gold. Come in, come in. Uh, so nice to see you. Beautiful day outside, no? <laughs> oh, you disagree? I am of likewise opinion. It's terrible day. Uh, pardon, please. Are uh, addressing Mr. Gregor? In person, in the flesh. Dmitri Gregor. Uh, you wish money changed? Gregor changes. Rubles, francs, pounds, marks, lira, yen, pesos, crowns. This visitor, Inspector Chen of police, at side number one, son. Chen? Oh, so, uh, you are perhaps visiting native home, yes? <laughs> Gregor will change dollars for you. Gregor... We aren't going back to China. Oh, but naturally, foolish thought. Who would make such a suggestion? Now, Gregor... Mr. Will, uh... Gregor, you are involved in serious crime. Oh, I am innocent. I was not there. Uh, I will bring witnesses. Attention, I... please. Observe IOU notes in hand. 
were taken from your messenger. Kindly explain source of notes, Mr. Gregor. From the messenger? Uh, but how did you... He's dead. He was in a car smash. Dead? Push. Authorities are now in charge. Kindly explain source of notes, please. How obtained? How much paid? At what date? I... I do not know. What do you mean you don't know? They're your notes, aren't they? No. I am collecting these debts for third party, on commission. So, his name, please. Oh, I cannot tell you. His client. You understand? Confidential. A Shuroff cannot remain in business if he tells what is confidential, not even if he is brave. I am not brave, Inspector. Gregor is frightened, Shuroff. I am not a brave man. You don't have to tell us. Most unfortunate, Mr. Gregor. But you will be in prison, Shroff, unless you give information. These notes you collect for clients, most probably forged. Forged? One of them was, and maybe the rest. All right. Very bad ethics, but I tell you. And when you see her, you tell her Gregor don't want any more business. Her? Da, da. A blonde lady, very pretty. She has office on California Street. Miss June Morris. I give you a dress. You tell her to come get monies Gregor collected for her and go away forever. Famous Russian philosopher named Goglitze once said about blonde... So sorry. Cannot discuss philosophy of lady at present. Must navigate self to office for personal interview. <laughs> Peter Bard, 1200 Van Ness. Jack Perry, 40 Sutter Place, Roy Pascal, 7820 Hyde Street. And that's all the obituaries for today. Right, Julie, I'll start on them. Did you pick up the collection from Gregor? Yesterday's 900. Here. Good enough. I'll be moving along now. Wait a minute, Dan. Huh? Well? What about my money? Oh, now, Julie. I'm taking the same chance as you are. I told you I want more money. Junie, I'm going to give you more than you think. You'll be getting everything I make out of this. What? What are you talking about? Wedding bells, my sweet. You're not joking, are you, Dan? Eh? Try this one for size. Mr. Temple, Mr. Temple. <laughs> Have a heart. I'm just a poor working girl. <laughs> All right, Junie, but how about that extra money now? I'll take it out in orange blossom. Good place. girl. That's what I hoped you'd say. Let's make it soon, eh? Fine. Good. I'll go and do some arranging then. Thanks for the list. I'll give it to Inky right away. Goodbye, Junie. Goodbye, Dan. Oh, and by the way, don't bother to pick up the money from Gregor's today. I'll save you the trip. You'll call for me later? Yes, Junie. I'll be calling for you. This is like it, Pop. June Morris, typewriting service. Shall I knock? Yes, sir. Try door. Nobody here, Pop. Hmm. Office is empty. Ah. Office exceeding tidy for busy typewriter service. Maybe she wasn't doing much work. Obvious, Miss Morris, do little typewriting. A rubber roller of machine scarcely marked. Huh. And what's this? Obituary notice from Daily Paper. Son, we'll see what's behind that door, please. All right, Pop. Hey, Pop, look, there's someone here. I think, I think. Unfortunate girl dead. Has been shot. Is it Miss Morris, do you think? This person afraid so. Blonde. As Gregor the Shroff said, was getting paper from shelves here when shot fired. Initials on lapel brooch say J.M. Suggest this indeed the lady we seek. Gosh, Pop, what do we do now? Great sage say, when sudden landslide close main road, traveler must reach destination by back lane.
We will return to the inimitable Charlie Chan in just a few moments. But in the meantime, your announcer. And now, back to the incomparable Charlie Chan. While Charlie Chan and his number one son are looking for other roads to lead them to the solution of the crime, Dan Temple is busy too. You find him hurrying through the streets, taking the stairs two at a time and bursting into his flat, anxious and excited. Inky! Hey, Inky! How right is, Dan? Uh, I just finished a very pretty bet. Now, listen, Inky. I... I ain't the kind of fella to pat myself on the back, Dan, but you certainly are the best artist in the business. You just want to look at the licenses and I'm right. That's art, Dan. Uh, yes, yes, I know, but we've got more important things on hand now, Inky. We're leaving town. Ah, uh, what for? We'll be in trouble with Junie if we stay. Ah, uh, what kind of trouble? Front trouble? <laughs> I'm not joking. We're leaving tonight. We'll start again in St. Louis, get a new girl, and make sure she's the brainless type. Uh, I've always liked St. Louis. You go down to Gregor's and pick up today's collection. Meet me here. I'll be packing. Well, uh, how about Junie? Uh, June won't be picking up the collection. Had a quarrel with her, eh? Oh, I, I wouldn't exactly call it that, Inky. No, 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 no. Junie's got ideas. I had to stall her off with some talk about wedding bells and orange blossoms. And she fell for it. <laughs> yeah, she fell for it. <laughs> and listen, Inky. Yeah. Don't say anything to Gregor, understand? Ah, uh, what did I have to say to him? Nothing, Inky, nothing. But even saying nothing can get you into trouble in this town. <laughs> Pop, I don't get it. What are we doing here in Chinatown? Patience, son. Patience. Oh. It's not going to do us any good hanging around outside the, uh, the, uh, what do you call a debt collector bloke? A shrap. It's oriental word for gentleman of this persuasion. This shrap is only road left to solution of case. Murder of Miss Morris left no clues. Must pick up trail here. How? Sam has followed instructions. I'm supposed to pour water on the knob of the door handle and keep it wet all the time. Correct. It's as wet as seal rock. Very good. Father will explain plan. Criminal must come to office to pick up money collected for him by Shroud. If we remain inside office, they frighten him away without revealing identity. Mm, I see that. But how will a wet doorknob show who we're looking for? Wait, please. Person approaches shop. Mm, we've watched ten people go in and come out already. How are we going to know the right man? Son will recognize suspect by blood on hands. Blood in his hands? Precisely. How is he going to get blood in his hands from a wet doorknob? Wait. Ah, observe hands of gentlemen just leaving. Golly, they're red, Pop. Come quickly, please. Stop! Uh, w what do you want, mister? This Inspector Chan of police. Observe credentials. You are under arrest. For, for what? Participation in murder of Miss June Morris. What? She was shot dead an hour ago. Murder? Shot? I, what? But I don't know anything about it. I swear it's... I'm oh, sorry. I... Come, please. Oh, wait a minute. Now, wait, Inspector. I didn't have anything to do with it. But I know who did. I know. I'll turn evidence, see? I'm too old to Got go to... Dr. Fax, please. Quickly. Uh, no wonder he's talking about leaving town. They're having trouble with Junie. And he never told me. Uh, get me in for a murder rap. And never told me. Who? Dan Temple. Ah, Criminal of lowest species from Chicago. This person acquainted with unsavory face. Yes, sir, fella. Dan Dimper. Up on telegraph here. You can get me for forgery, Inspector. But not for killing. You want Dan Temper for that. Yeah. I'd better pack everything. I, I don't want to leave anything behind Inky, that 
at you. All right, all right, just a second. Listen, Inky, I... Gregor. Let me in, Dan, quick. Where's Inky? Very bad news, Dan. What are you talking about? Your business is finished. Uh, you're telling me. What about Inky? He's finished for good, Dan. Now, don't rush and talk with Gregor. I... Hey, what's the gun for? You, Dan. I... Say, listen, I... Very sorry, Dan. Gregor is frightened, Shroff. You know... I'm frightened now. Bad. That detective, Chan, comes a little too close for comfort. I try to stop him. I think maybe I take care of Miss Morris in time. I was wrong. Now I take care of you. I, uh, Gregor, I... Can't let anybody tell what they know about Gregor, Dan. Can't let you tell Chan. You double-crossing... No, Dan. Dan. You... Give me that gun. Dan. You crazy man. You sink. Do not shoot the revolver, Mr. Gregor. What? <laughs> Charlie Chan speaking. Behind you is number one son, also concealed. Have been trapped, Mr. Gregor, with last-minute assistance of Mr. Temple. Drop gun, please. I've got you covered, Gregor. You better do it. Pop stairs. You were right, Inspector. I... I only half believed you when you talked me into this. Pop's almost always right. You'll keep your word, Inspector, eh? I'll not be charged with murder. This person's iron word will be kept, Mr. Temple. We'll receive justice for participation in confidence trick. No more. Mr. Dimitri Gregor will be sole beneficiary of trial for murder. You fat, smart trick of you. Many thanks for praying. You were indeed frightened, Shroff. Very shortly will be executed, Shroff. But truly it is written. Fear follows crime and is punishment for same. They got a pretty good write up of the case in the papers, Pop. Ah. Father instructed son to read papers for news, not ancient history. Gregor was in with Temple. Mm hmm. So when he found out we were on the trail, he tried to cover up. Precisely. As this person suspected Shroff after murder of Miss Morris, was only person who knew intention to question them. Yes, it could have been Temple. He was with her just before we came. Mr. Temple only annoyed and frightened at demand of Miss Morris for more money. Put her off and then attempted to leave town. There's two things I want to know, Pop. First, what was that blood on Inky's hand? <laughs> Very simple. Your father secretly dusted envelopes containing collected money in Shroff's office with anthracene dye. Anthracene? What's anthracene? Invisible dust, which turns blood red on contact with water. Used often in counterfeit cases. Ah, oh, I see. And Inky got his hands wet on the doorknob. Then when he picked up the dusted envelopes, the dye stained his hands red. Precisely. First question answered. Aha, uh -huh, but here's the second. In the paper, it says that Mrs. Dace discovered the forgery and assisted you in catching the criminal. Now, that's stretching the truth, Pop. Why'd you do it? Ah, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Dace suffered because of crime. Entire life smashed. Now has profited from solution of second crime. Has achieved uh, standing in community and... Uh, an honor in eyes of friends. Well, she won't try to run away anymore. Precisely. And she has learned valuable lesson of Manchus, who said, Trouble is like man's shadow. Can never run fast enough to escape either.
before this person has further words with you, here is an answer with words of wisdom. Before saying good night, Charlie Chan would like to leave you few words of ancient philosopher. Just when we are giving up seeking, it's time to find. Good night. Thank you. Be sure to join us next week at this same time for The Adventures of Charlie Chan, based on the famous character created by Earl de Biggers. This is a Grace Gibson Radio production produced by Reg Johnston. CIB is the next show. This episode is called The Case of the Farmer's Boots. CIB. of Australasian police cases come these true stories of day and night vigilance that protect our lives and our property, of prevention and detection in the unceasing war against crime, CIB. From New Zealand, the true story of the case of the farmer's boots. This is a true story from the records of Australasian police cases. Only names, place names and dates have been altered. Murder is not always a sudden thing. Sometimes it comes as the result of a hatred built up over a long period. It was that way with Raymond Cooper, a young New Zealand dairy farmer. But there was nothing logical or sensible about his attitude. He was capable of building up a towering sense of injustice over trifles. Cooper was what we'd call a paranoic, and at this time this story begins, a matter of 25 years ago, he was nursing an unreasoning anger against his neighbours, the Maguires. One afternoon, he walked into his house looking anything but amiable. You're back early, Ray. What's wrong? Ah, it's those flaming Maguires again. I've had enough. What have they done this time? They've stolen some cows. That's what they've done. How do you know? They were grazing by the creek over by the Maguires' north paddock. I know him. It would have been as easy as taking a bath to nick over and grab those three cows. Oh, Ray, do you really think that's right? You know what your fences are like up there. The cows could have wandered anywhere. Ah, oh, don't be so naive, Jean. You think everybody in this world is like the kids you teach at Sunday school? Hmm, I'm sure the Maguires are perfectly nice people. That's what you think. Maguire's been at me all the year. First, he wants to share the rights to the creek. Then he wants a track through the boundary fence. He couldn't get that, so he goes for a seat on the Shire Council. Well, lots of people like to help with the Shire Council. Ah, not him. He's trying to undermine me. But he's overstepped the mark this time. You can't thieve people's cattle and get away with it. You'd better be careful, Ray. It's dangerous to talk like that. Careful? You're telling me to be careful. He's the one that's got to look out. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going over to see those Maguires right now. Oh, Ray, don't do that, please. Why don't you wait? You don't settle anything that way. Oh, yes, you do. That's the only way you do settle anything. Not by sitting and mooning out the window the way you're doing. I'll be back when you see me. Uh, what's wrong with them? They keep...
keep a man waiting all day. Oh, come on, can't you? Oh, hello, Mr. Cooper. Is your husband in, Mrs. McGuire? No, Jeb's gone into Hamilton. Won't be back before six o'clock. Oh, that's nice, that is. I wanted to have a few words with him. Oh, perhaps you'd like to have them with me. I know as much about the place as he does. Can you come in? No. All I got to say, I can say out here. All right, then. I'll come out in the veranda. I want to know what's happened to my three cows that were grazing by the creek near your north paddock. I'm sure I don't know. You had a good look around? I haven't had a good look around your place, Mrs. McGuire. What are you suggesting? You know what I'm suggesting. I'm not going to beat about the bush. I reckon your husband's taken. What a nerve you've got. Jeb's always been too soft with you. Let me tell you, it's a different kettle of fish when you say things like that to me. Now don't try and cover it up. You know all about it. Oh, we wouldn't steal your miserable cows. It's funny, really, that you've got the nerve to come here and accuse us of anything. Or have you forgotten Hilda Robbins? What, what about Hilda Robbins? She was your girlfriend, wasn't she? Tell me how she was murdered. They never solved that one, did they? What are you getting at? They had an inquest. There was no evidence against me oh, at all. Oh, wasn't there? Just the same. Everybody knows who did it. Yeah, that's typical of you, Maguire's. Spreading slander against a man. You want to get rid of me, don't you? Well, you'll just wait. I'll get even. Well, I don't doubt that for a moment. Given half a chance, I suppose you'll fix me and Jeb the same way as you did Hilda Robbins. Don't you talk to me like that! Oh, get out. Go on. Get out of here before I put the dogs on you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Sergeant. Fletcher's my name, Tom Fletcher. Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Fletcher? I have a place ten miles down the road, Sergeant, the next door to Jeb McGuire's. I thought I'd better let you know that Jeb and his wife have both disappeared. Disappeared? Yes. Well, how I found out was he didn't milk his cows last night. They were bellowing like one thing. I took my boy Jim over to see what was up. Nobody was there, so we milked the cows between us. Oh, perhaps they were called away to some emergency. I thought of that too, but I've changed my mind. Why was that? Well, Jeb always puts his cream cans on the road by his gate. Actually, he's got a little stand there. Bill Morrow, he's the carter bloke, can pick them up without even getting down from the truck. Well? Well, this time the cream cans weren't on the stand. They were down on the road, and Bill had to get off his truck to pick them up. And that's never happened before. You think somebody else put out those cream cans? I do. And I think something's happened to Jeb and his wife. No dairy farmer would go off and leave his cows unmilked. Not without telling his neighbour. And it would have been me he'd have told, and not his other neighbour. Why not, Mr Fletcher? Who is his other neighbour, anyway? Well, you know him. Ray Cooper. A real nasty piece of work. Jeb's been feuding with him for years. Yeah, that's so. Uh, I'd heard about that. And another thing. Late yesterday afternoon, there was a terrific lot of smoke coming from a shed at the back of Cooper's house. Was there anything odd about that? I don't suppose so. I guess he was burning off. The only thing is, it, it was such a dark colour. Almost like oil or something. Besides, you don't usually burn, burn off on a Sunday. Anybody else remarked on the Maguire's absence? Only Jack Hepburn. Jack does a bit of butchering on the side, and Jeb always goes to his place on a Sunday to pick up his meat. Well, Jeb's meat is still there waiting to be collected. Hmm. I suppose you'd know the Maguire's better than most, wouldn't you? They're my oldest friends. One way or another, I spend half my time in their house. I'm telling you, Sergeant, something's happened to those two. And I think you should look into it right away. That's exactly what I intend to do. And I'd like you to come with me, if you would, Mr Fletcher. Well, no point in knocking, Sergeant. You saw the milk cans out there. If Jeb was home, we'd have brought him in. Mm, you'd imagine, sir. Well, go in, then. The door won't be locked. Uh, you leave, Mr Fletcher. You know the place. And that's the main bedroom in there. Hmm. The bed's not slept in, I see. Over here is the kitchen. Just have a look at this. What is it? There's their dinner on the top of the stove. Been there all night by the look of it. Hmm, sausages and vegetables, stone cold. Mrs. McGuire must have put them there to keep them hot for some reason. Well, they certainly must have been called away suddenly. I don't like it, Sergeant. 
Otherwise, is everything the way it usually is? I, I mean, does anything seem to be missing? Well, I had a good look round before, when I was trying to get a clue what had happened to them. A pea rifle's gone and a shotgun. Yeah, they indeed. Anything else? Well, I looked in Jeb's wardrobe. Apart from his working clothes, well, he'd have been wearing these, of course, there's a suit missing and a pair of my boots. Your boots? Yes, I left them here last week. Too muddy to wear to town, so I changed into a pair I'd brought with me and dumped these here. Uh, but whoever took them wouldn't know that. That's what I thought. He'd have taken it for granted they were Jeb's boots. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, there's only one thing to do now. What's that? We'll have to search the property from end to end. The swamp is as good a place to start as any. Sergeant, come over here a moment. Yeah? What is it, Mr. Fletcher? Look at those bags in the duck pond. Yeah. Yes, they shouldn't be there, surely. Can you get over to them? Oh, easily. The water's only about six inches deep. Pick up the bags and look underneath. Just a minute, I can't quite... Oh, no. What is it, Mr. Fletcher? It's poor Margaret, Mrs. Maguire. I'd say she'd been beaten to death. Come in. Oh, it's you, Mr. Fletcher. Come along in. I just thought I'd come round and see if there was anything new, Sergeant. No, I'm afraid there's nothing much to report. Since Mrs. Maguire's body was discovered, we've gone over every inch of the property. We must have questioned about 200 people up and down the district. Still not a trace of him. What about the death of Mrs. Maguire? Well, they've held a post-mortem. And what's the result? Well, they found extensive bruises on her face. Even her dental plate was damaged. But the actual cause of death seems to have been drowning. What do you think happened then? Well, that's yet to be found out. But presumably the murderer knocked her down, possibly knocking her unconscious. Then maybe he dragged her to the pond and drowned her, throwing the bags on afterwards. What a hideous thing to do. Mind, that's only a theory. But the big problem at the moment is, what's happened to her husband? We can't get anywhere until we locate him. Why don't you have another talk with Cooper? I intend to. Somehow I can't help feeling that if anyone can give us a lead, he can. So you're still trying to find out what happened to Jeb Maguire? Well, to me, it's as clear as daylight. Why do you say that, Mr. Cooper? Well, he murdered the old girl and went for his life. Is an obvious, Sergeant? Uh, it's not as simple as all that, you know. Why didn't he take any of his belongings with him, apart from his boots and one suit of clothes? Because he wanted to make a good, clean getaway. It's as easy as pie. You want to find the murderer? Then find Jeb Maguire. He did it. Not that I care. It's your problem, not mine, thank goodness. It certainly was a problem Sergeant Bradshaw had in his hands. Cooper deftly threw suspicion on Maguire, and for a time it was impossible to contradict him, because Maguire had completely disappeared. The alert for Jeb Maguire went out all over New Zealand. His photograph was published again and again in all the newspapers. The government offered a hundred pounds reward for information as to his whereabouts. But Sergeant Bradshaw still held to his original theory. He thought he had a fair idea of what had happened to Jeb Maguire. Several days after the finding of Mrs. Maguire's body, the sergeant was inspecting an old farm cart. With him was a policeman, Constable David Rosser. It's a funny old cart, isn't it? Old's oh, right. I've never seen one quite like it. Well, it dates back to the 1880s. <laughs> Long before your time, Dave. <laughs> Wonder what it's doing here, Sergeant. I don't know. It hasn't been here very long. Look, there's a very faint track. It's been pushed about a quarter of a mile from the back of the house to this spot, which is, uh, let me see, about uh, 20 yards from Cooper's boundary fence. Oh, you wouldn't think anybody would dare move it at all. You'd think it'd fall apart. Well, it didn't, apparently. Have you a penknife, Dave? Uh, yes. Here you are. Uh, oh, what a penknife. 
Big enough to chop down a tree. Well, you never know. A knife like that can come in handy. <laughs> That's so. Uh, uh, come over here. I'm going to try scraping between the boards on the floor of the car. What is it, mud? Oh, I don't think so. Have a closer look. Hmm. I see what you mean. What would you say that is? Dried blood, I'd imagine. So would I. I believe a body was carried in this cart. And if you look over the fence there, you'll see another set of wheel marks. But not of the same cart? No. The tracks are quite different. Is that right? That means a body could have been transferred from one cart to another. Sergeant, I think you're onto something. Uh, you never want to get too optimistic in this business, because you run into too many disappointments. But surely this is a pretty good indication that Jeb Maguire was murdered. Well, I'll grant you things are beginning to add up. I've been making a close study of Maguire's tool shed this morning. And that's where the cart tracks lead from. Well? And it's far too clean. Looks as if it had been just scrubbed down and actually scraped in parts. To get rid of bloodstains? Could be. How do you think he died? Oh, I don't know yet. But a pea rifle and a shotgun were both missing from the house. Oh, I didn't know that. Now, tell me, Dave. Say you just shot a man right here and you wanted to get rid of the gun. How would you go about it? Mm, well, it's a bit difficult. I'd probably bury it just to go over there and throw it in the swamp. No. We're going to drain that swamp and see what's at the bottom. Impossible for the police to drain all the swamp, but the parts that couldn't be drained they dragged with painstaking thoroughness. And they found the pea rifle that had been missed from Maguire's house. That afternoon, Sergeant Bradshaw decided it was high time to pay another call on Raymond Cooper. Oh, you back again, I, eh, Sergeant? Yes, Mr. Cooper. Well, you know, I'm only too anxious to do what I can to help you. Yes, I've noticed that already. In fact, uh, I've received wonderful cooperation from everybody in this district. Dozens of people have come forward and volunteered information. I don't think there's anyone who hasn't been prepared to join the search parties. They've all been in it, eh? Strangely enough, all except you, Mr. Cooper. Oh, now, turn it up. I'm the man who gave you the straight information on Maguire in the first place. What do you mean? I told you how it happened. Maguire bumped off his old woman and went for his life. Can't say I blame him. I'd have done the same if I had to live with her. Well, that theory would be very nice, except that we have reason to believe that Maguire is dead, too. Not a hope. He wouldn't have the nerve to kill himself? Possibly not, but somebody else might have. Mm, you're welcome to think what you like. I've tried to tell you what happened. Mr. Cooper, we found some tracks left by Maguire's old cart. Those tracks lead up to your boundary fence. And more tracks lead from the fence on your side round to the back of your house. Well, what of it? Just this. We found bloodstains on Maguire's cart. Also, bloodstains on your cart. What's been going on around here? You've got no right to go snooping around my house. Now, just a minute, Mr. Cooper. You're trying to pen this on me. I'm not going to stand for it, you see. Now, don't get upset. If you want to avoid suspicion, the best thing you can do is cooperate. You can suspect all you like. I'm in the clear. Well, then, you don't mind if we look around a little. Would you object if we drained your sheep dip? I don't give a hoot what you do. Snoop all you like. But just be careful. I've got a property to run here. Don't you waste any of my sheep dip. We'll watch it. You'd better. If that sheep dip goes and any of my sheep die, I'll hold you responsible. I'm sorry we had to call you in again, Mr. Fletcher, but you're the only one who knew Jeb McGuire well enough to help us. That's all right, Sergeant. What's doing? We've switched our investigations to Cooper's property, and this afternoon we drained his sheep dip. Were you looking for something in particular? Anything that would give us a lead. At the bottom of the dip, we found this cigarette lighter. Do you recognize it? Of course I do. It's Jeb's. You're quite positive? Yes, he was never without it. Why, well, I'd say Jeb had that lighter for the best part of ten years. I even recognize the wick in it. Huh? How could Look, you? Look, the wick's homemade. I remember when he put it in. It's made out of cotton he got from his wife's work basket. I remember because I told him it'd never work. It did, though. Even with that homemade wick, the lighter light lit every time. Well, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. You've been quite a help. Oh, I don't see how. 
I mean, the lighter can't help you much. Well, it's not proof, but it's the first real indication that Jeb Maguire might be found on Cooper's property. So what are you going to do now? Well, Cooper was complaining about interference on his place before. Well, there'll be a lot more complaints now. I'm going to send a team out there tomorrow, and we're going to dig Cooper's place over from end to end. There must be more around than just a cigarette lighter. Sergeant Bradshaw was right. There was a great deal more around. The police said about one of the most extensive digging operations ever carried out in a murder investigation. They did, in fact, dig over Cooper's entire property, delving around every building and outhouse and all over the orchard and the garden. They took what they found back to Hamilton in a large cardboard box. Twelve hours later, Sergeant Bradshaw was telling Constable Rosser the story. Well, Dave, no wonder Cooper was so insistent that Maguire had cleared out. You mean he told that story thinking Maguire would never be found? Exactly. Cooper burned Maguire's body, and to make sure that his disappearance was absolutely complete, he scattered what couldn't be burned far and wide over the property. Mm, must have taken him hours and hours to do it. Yes, but it took a heck of a lot longer to find it all again. But now I've checked and double-checked everything. Fletcher, his neighbour, has identified a few of the things. Well, what were they, Sergeant? Well, there was a nice old cherrywood pipe Maguire always smoked. We found the charred bits of it. The metal parts of the fireman-type braces he always wore, and bits of his gum boots, his watch, personal things like that. But what about the body? Well, the scientific branch has been working on that all night. They've identified 52 bones as forming parts of a human skull. As for the other bones, According to the tests applied, they were burnt very recently. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? What can make a man do a thing like that to another? Yes, but that's not our worry. Cooper's going to have a job explaining all this away. Which reminds me, he should be here by now. It's an hour and a half since they went out to pick him up. Maybe they had a bit of trouble locating him. These farmers get... Hello? Yes, yeah, speaking. What? Surely not. But there was a guard right round the place. Oh, I see. Okay, I'll take it down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Persecution. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Yes, all right. As soon as you can. Thanks, Johnson. What's happened, Sergeant? Well, Cooper's got away. Just as it was getting dark, he slipped out of a back window and disappeared. What did his wife have to say? That he'd left her a letter. I took a note of the wording. Dear Jean, I'm leaving. I can't stand the endless persecution. Don't think of me anymore. Within an hour, I shall be dead. Forgive me, Ray. He's going to commit suicide. If you can believe the note, I'd say it was highly unlikely. Cooper once said that Jeb Maguire wouldn't have the nerve to commit suicide. I doubt if Cooper would either. Let me see now. You said your name was Cooper, I think. That's right. Are you the Raymond Cooper the police have been looking for over the past week? Yes, I'm Raymond Cooper, all right. And I want a good lawyer. I need someone to get me out of this. You do plenty of criminal cases, don't you? Well, I have defended in a few cases, yes. How do you wish to plead in this case? Well, not guilty, of course. I didn't have anything to do with Maguire's death. There's quite an account in this morning's paper. What's it say? Quite a bit. The way I read it, the police have done a pretty good job of reconstruction. Ah, they're making it all up. You know that couldn't be true, Mr. Cooper. Well, most of it's sure to be sheer imagination. Well, I mean to say... The police aren't given to imagining things, you know. Oh, and another thing. There's a photo of you in the paper, with a caption saying you're being sought for questioning. And that's why I'm here. You've got to think of some way of getting me out of it. Mr. Cooper, I'm a reputable lawyer. You've come to me for advice. Well, the only advice I can give you is that you must go at once to the police. But I can't do that. I'm afraid you must. And for my part, I intend to call the police immediately to tell them that you've been to see me. If, as you say, you're innocent, then you've nothing to fear. Believe me, this is the best way to handle it, Mr. Cooper. The city solicitor was as good as his word and immediately called the police. 
Cooper was arrested and charged. The prosecution called no less than 78 witnesses. The trial lasted for four weeks. The evidence was so damning that when Cooper was invited to enter the witness box and refute the police reconstruction of the crime, he refused, apparently considering it useless. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Some weeks later, Cooper's neighbour, Mr Fletcher, was talking with Sergeant Bradshaw. You know, Sergeant, I don't know when anything's impressed me so much as the way you police managed to reconstruct Cooper's actions. Down to the last detail, as you might say. Well, it took a bit of patience. Patience? Yes, and cleverness too. I mean, from the time Cooper took the shotgun and the pre-rifle from McGuire's house and went and hid in the tool shed. That's right. That's how Mrs. McGuire came to be involved. When she came past the shed, he panicked, knocked her unconscious and dragged her inside. And it tricked me for a long while why he'd stolen a suit of clothes and a pair of boots from McGuire's house. But you jumped to it that he was trying to make it appear that he'd murdered his wife and then cleared out. Exactly. Just one other thing, Sergeant. When did you first become convinced that Jeb Maguire had been murdered? When you pointed out to me that Cooper had taken your boots in mistake for Maguire's. That was the first big lead? Yes. If Maguire really had murdered his wife and skipped off, he would have taken his own boots, not a pair of yours that had been left at the house. When Cooper picked up the first pair he saw. Of course, he wasn't to know who owned them. It's funny how the little things so often lead to the solving of a murder. Yes, they're the things we police are trained to look for. I'll guarantee that Ray Cooper never thought an old pair of boots would catch him. Only names, place names and dates were altered in this true story. It was dramatised from the records of Australasian police cases. And now this is Roland Strong saying goodbye till next week will be another true story in this series which is produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. Danger with Granger is next up, and this episode is called Rainy Night Murder. with Granger. He saw me. Let's find a policeman quickly. Oh, he's there. Oh, what? I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Please help me. I've got to get to a policeman. And before we do anything, we better move into that doorway. Out of this rain. Come on. Oh, but Mr. Come on, come on. Now, what happened? Fight with the husband? Oh, no, no. It's, it's the man. What? He saw me. He's going to kill me. What man? Where? A big man. He was wearing a gray hat. He was right behind me. You're wrong, baby. There's nobody behind you. Take a look. But I saw him, I tell you. You were running towards me and nearly knocked me over. You may take my word for little lady, there was no one behind you. But he was after me. I know he was. Do you know this man in the gray hat? No. Then why would he chase you on a rainy night? Because I... I saw him commit murder. This is Steve Granger, private detective, with a story about a rainy night which was the setting for violent death, and which, just incidentally, almost had me labeled by my friends in the police department as nuts. In just a moment, I'll take you back to one of my most interesting cases. I took a good look at the young woman who'd bumped into me in the rain and found a blonde youngster in her early 20s dressed in nothing but a drenched summer dress which clung to her skin like a label to a perfume bottle. Mr. Please. Now, where did you see this man in the gray hat commit murder? From my apartment. Now, what's your name? Pat. Pat Benton. No. Oh, please. Please look back again. I'm sure he's following me. Pat, there's no one else around. Now, come on. Let's, let me take you home. Oh, but I'm frightened. I can't go back there. Look, baby, I'm Steve Granger, private detective. We'll see that you're safe. Then you can tell me the whole story. If it holds together, I'll call in the law. Now, is that a deal? Well, yes. Okay. Now, let's hurry. You're soaking wet. I went ahead of the girl and checked her apartment. It was empty. Then while she changed into some dry clothes, I looked it over. 
It was typical of hundreds of New York apartments. One room doubling for living and sleeping. A window that looked out over a fire escape and three lines of dingy laundry. The window opposite was dark. Well, I feel better now, Mr. Granger. Well, you'll look a little bit better, too. Now, uh, suppose you tell me how you happened to witness a murder. Hmm? Well, it was just a little while ago. You see, when I've got nothing to do at night, I sit by the window and look out over the court. You look into other tenants' windows? Oh, it's a harmless diversion, and you'd be surprised what you see. I can imagine. Go on. My room was dark. I, I turned off my lights. There was a man in a chair by the window just opposite. Uh, that one? The one that's dark? Yeah. I, I, he was reading. Mm. Then he got up and, and went to the door and opened it. A man and a woman came in. This was the man in the gray hat? Yeah. Can you describe the woman? She was uh, wearing a, a blue dress and a white stole. It, it looked like it was made out of linen or something. Did you see her face? No. And they just walked in and killed this man. Was that it? Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't, wasn't like that at all. Mm. They, they seemed to be very good friends. The man who'd been sitting by the window mixed some drinks, and as they talked, the woman sat opposite him. Did it look like they were having an argument? Oh, no, no. Suddenly, the man in the gray hat moved around to the back of the other man's chair. The woman looked up at him and nodded her head. That's when I saw the knife. All right, go on. He plunged it into the man's back. Mr. Granger, it was awful. I've never seen anything like that before. How did the killer happen to see you? Well, I, I was leaning out of my window. The lights in the apartment up above were turned on, and they shone right down on me. I, I screamed, and the man in the gray hat looked across, and he saw me. You sure about all this? Of course. I moved away from the window. I went over and picked up the telephone. You were going to call the police, is that it? Yes, but there was a knock on the door. I had a terrible feeling it was the man in the gray hat. He knew I was a witness to what had taken place. You didn't call? I was afraid he'd hear me and break the door down. I waited. He tried the door. Then I heard scratching, like he was trying a key in the lock. You keep saying he. How did you know it was a man? After a few minutes had passed, I went over and opened my door. I saw him standing at the end of the hall. It was the man in the gray hat. He was waiting for me. How'd you get out? I went down the fire escape. Thought if I could find a policeman, he could arrest him. Mm. Now, I'll just use your phone. Are you calling the police? But was there a dial tone on this phone when you tried it? Yeah. Well, it's dead now. It's not working? Nope. It must be the man in the gray hat. He cut the lines. There must be 50 telephones in this building, and your line would be pretty hard to find. Well, what do we do? The terminal box should be in the basement. Let's go down. See if your line's been disconnected. Oh, but I'm afraid. He's come back. He knows I'm here. What do we do? You get in the kitchen. I'll answer it. All right, but I'm so frightened. Don't make a sound. Yep. Oh, I beg your pardon. I, uh, I was looking for a young woman. I'm sorry, there's no young woman here. Yeah, I must have got the wrong apartment number. So what's the young woman's name? It doesn't matter. I have her phone number. I'll call her and get the correct address. Good night. Okay, he's gone. Was it him? The man wearing the gray hat? No, this was a heavy set filler, about 45. Had on a brown suit. That's the man. Oh, Mr. Granger, I'm afraid. Okay, lock the window. And when I leave, lock the door. Oh, no. I'm afraid to stay here alone. I can't... Okay, Miss Benton. Then you better come along with me. It's dark down here. Let me see. No terminal box on this side. Mr. Granger. Hmm? Don't you think you ought to call the police? Just a minute, Pat. Oh, here it is. Uh, we'll see if your line was cut or what happened. Hey, that light in the far corner, it's out. Stand still. Somebody down here with us. Man in the gray hat. He's going to kill us. Stop that. He can't see any better than we can. Now, don't make a sound. He knows where we are. He's coming to us. Shh. I can't stand it anymore. Help somebody. Uh, Help. All right, you just one. I'd started after the mysterious stranger, but must have misjudged my distance and passed him because he clipped me right behind the ear. I did a slow, ungraceful swan dive and landed on my face. I'll continue with this interesting story in a minute.
I came to in the basement of Pat Benton's apartment house. Groaning, I got to my feet and found the light switch. A dim glow flooded the basement with a bilious yellow light. Pat Benton had disappeared. This was the door to the girl's apartment. I listened to the panel, hoping for some sound. There was none. Inside, I flipped the light switch. There was no one there. I picked up the phone. The dial tone, which hadn't been there a little while before, was back. I dialed my friend, Lieutenant Jake Rankin, at police headquarters. Rankin speaking. Oh, this is Granger. I got something for you. Why, thanks, Gumshoe. I haven't a thing to do down here. I'm just aching for some work, along with a ton of labor on my desk right now. Well, what's on your alleged mind? I'm in the apartment of a girl named Pat Benton. It's 2479 West 44th Street. Are you having a good time? Something strange happening. I met her on the street. She claimed she saw a murder committed. So? I came back to investigate. Her telephone was out of order. We went out of the basement to check up. I got slugged. She disappeared. So what do you want me to do? I'm in homicide, not the missing persons bureau. Get a John Doe warrant and drop around. I'd like to see the inside of a certain apartment. <laughs> Okay, so you went downstairs to check the telephone. You got hit. You woke up. The girl was gone. She was sitting right here by this window. She claimed she saw a man stabbed by another man wearing a gray hat. There was a woman with him. Where? Over in that apartment across the court? Yes, bright eyes. How about dropping over and paying a visit? I notice there's a light now. It's been dark until just a few minutes ago. Well, I don't know, Granger. Barging into apartments at this hour of the night... It... Hey, suppose the girl was a crackpot. She was plenty frightened, but she wasn't a crackpot. Now, how about it? All right, I'll go along with you. This once. Now, this must be it. Let's see. This is funny. The name on the plate says Hannah Rosley. The Benton girl gave me the impression that a man lived in this apartment. So what? Well, let's take a chance anyway. With shots in the basement, you'd have a legitimate reason to ask questions. Right. Somebody's home, all right. I can hear him rustling around. Who's there? Police department. Police? What's wrong? I'm Lieutenant Rankin, ma'am. We got a report that been some shots fired in this building. Shots? Yes. Have you heard anything? No, no, not a thing. How long have you been home? Why, well, I just got in a little while ago. Hmm. Would you like to come in and look around? <laughs> in case you think I've been indulging in a little target practice. Well, Miss Rosalie, uh... Maybe we ought to, uh... Look down in that areaway, Lieutenant. Might spot something. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, by all means, come in. Look all you like. You'll, uh, you'll find I'm a very law-abiding person. I'll just open this window for a second, miss. See anything? No, not a thing. It's too dark. Well, you finished? Yeah. Well, thank you, Miss Rosalie, and we're sorry about the intrusion. Oh, don't mention it, Lieutenant. Uh, good night. Good night. Granger, are you sure you're not dreaming all this up? Nope. Why the gag about the window? Wanted to check the chairs the Benton girl told me about. And? It would be possible for a man to do exactly as she said. I used the window routine to check the chairs for blood stains. There were none. No, and I didn't see any dead bodies either. They could have disposed of the body. Could have been hidden in a closet. Granger... Hannah Rosie lives in that apartment, alone. Why would a man be sitting there? There was a man there sometime tonight. What? The ashtray next to the chair where Pat Benton claimed she saw the man was loaded with ashes from a pipe. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. She could have had a male visitor earlier. Uh-huh. Now, look, Gumshoe. I'm leaving this to you. Give me a description of the Benton girl. I'll turn at headquarters. Okay. I got another idea, too. Got your car here? Park to the curb. Why? I think we're being watched. Where? Ooh. The watcher wouldn't be that obvious. Ooh. Car's over there, by that fire hydrant. I'll go with you. But drop me off at the next corner. Coming back here? What have I got to lose? I rode to the corner with the police lieutenant, got off, walked into a phone booth and dialed a number. A minute later, I was talking to Cal Hendricks. Hiya, Stevie. What's on your mind? Cal... Get out your thinking cap and do a take on a woman named Hannah Rosley. She's about 35, red hair, 5 feet 6 in heels, dresses well, sounds like a well-educated person. Okay, you want me to check Hannah Rosley. What else? I'll be prowling an apartment building at 2479 or 2481 West 44th Street. If you come up with anything, call Rankin. (laughs) 
I moved out of the drugstore from where I'd phoned the newspaper man and back to towards 2481 West 44th, block away. Close to the building, I got a break. The man scurried out of 2479 and went next door to 2481. And I recognized him. It was the man who'd been looking for Pat Benton when I answered the door of her apartment. This was interesting. 2479 was Pat Benton's building. 2481 was the building in which Hannah Rosalie had her apartment. The one where Pat saw a murder committed. It looked to me that a tale for the man in the gray hat was in order. In just a minute, I'll bring you the climax of the case. When I saw the man who Pat Benton said was a murderer go into number 2481... I slipped into the courtyard between the two buildings and made use of the fire escape, which led to Hannah Rosalie's window. I parked outside, feeling like the end man in a bad minstrel show. Peering underneath a drawn shade, I could see the man and could barely hear the voices. They're gone. Yeah, just as I said. The police officer took the other man with him in his car. I recognize the other man. He's Steve Granger. A private eye? Yeah. He doesn't know you. Oh, no. Well, we can't take a chance now. We'll have to dispose of the girl as well as Kelvin's body. How? They have Granger's revolver. I'll have a little surprise for him. You're going to kill her? With this gun. With his gun. The police will ask questions when they find her body. It'll divert suspicion. But that's murder. What we did to our friend was murder, too, my dear. I was very careful to carry Granger's gun in my handkerchief. The only prints will be his. Very smart, Will. Now, you go over to the girl's apartment. Pack her clothes in that old suitcase. I'll seek it in Long Island Sound after I dispose of her. Uh, where are you going now? To get the car. Then I'll get the girl out of the basement. Will, wait. Wouldn't it be better just to have the girl disappear? Look, baby, I'll do it my way, and don't you ever forget that. I'd heard enough. The spot where Pat Benton was being held prisoner. It took two minutes to get over to 2479 and down the steps to the cellar. I remembered seeing a doorway that led into a laundry room, probably filled with automatic washes and whatnot, and figured it as a logical place to hide the girl. This was the laundry room. Over in one corner, there was a pile of linens. Underneath, I looked into the frightened eyes of the Benton girl. Take it easy, Pat. I'll have you out of here in two seconds. Your pal did a nice gag job on you. There you are. Let's, let's get at those cords. Come on. I was afraid he'd come back. He's going to. But he'll be in for a disappointment. There you are. Can you stand? Come on, let me help you. My, my legs, I can't move them. Well, rub them as hard as you can. We haven't much time. You'll be here shortly. How did you find me? Never mind. Keep rubbing. Oh, they sting. Try walking. I'll help you. Come on. You have had a foot go to sleep. but nothing like this. Yeah. Uh-oh. Hold it. It's your friend. We're going to find a place to hide. Over there behind the furnace. And move as softly as you can. Quick and don't make a sound. Finds out you've gone. He'll look around the laundry room first. Is there a back way out of here? Yes, over there. A door that leads up to the street. Oh, come on. Watch in back of us while I get this door open. You see anything? He's still in the laundry room. Good. Now hurry up. And if he sees us, you run while I distract him. Grab a taxi and go to police headquarters. Tell Lieutenant Rankin what's happened. All right. Go on ahead of me. Turn around. He's turned around. He, he's seen us. Yeah. Right, come on. Let's move, girly, fast. Where? The police? No. First to my apartment. <laughs> Mr. Granger, don't you think the man in the gray hat might come over here to my apartment? Uh-huh. That reminds me. A gun. That's right. This trip will take no chances. And I want to make a phone call. Hello, Cal. What'd you find out? 
Uh-huh. I see. Yeah. They did. Uh, did you get a description of the man? Uh-huh. Yeah, this begins to add up. Sure, that's why one was killed. Yeah, thanks, Cal. You're a great help. Good night. No, no, I don't need another thing. See you tomorrow. It was Cal Hendricks, an old pal. He locked up your friends for me. I think I know why that man was killed. Why? Anna Rosalie has been working around the country with two men. One is named Will Stanick. The other one's name is unknown. They were last seen in Chicago where they fleeced some widow out of her life savings. But why was the one man killed? Well, Stanick is the man who tied you up. He knifed his partner. Probably a disagreement about money. Or even a double cross. Then the police can pick him up and we won't have to worry? Yeah. Except for one thing. What happened to the body of the man who was killed? It wasn't found? No. But when Lieutenant Rankin learns the truth, I have an idea that uh, Miss Rosalie will talk. I want you to help me. How? Ever see one of these before? Why, no, no, I haven't. Well, it's a blackjack. You hold it like this and apply it to the top of the person's head, right? Oh, I've seen it done in the movies. And you know how to do it? Well, I, I could try. Okay, use it if you have to. Now, don't spare the muscle. Both of these people are killers, remember? I know. Mm -hmm. We've got to bring these characters out into the open. That's the door. It'll be him. Stand over there. Look natural. And put that blackjack out of sight. All right. Oh. Mr. Gray. Come in, Miss Rosalie. Oh, there you are, Pat. I've been looking all over for you. You stay away from me. Oh, now, really, that's no way to talk to your cousin. Mr. Green, you keep her away from Would me. Would you mind explaining, Miss Rosalie? Oh, Pat is my cousin. She's, she's been having a little trouble. It's affected her mind. Oh? Uh -huh. That's why we got apartments overlooking each other. I, I can keep an eye on her. Uh-huh. You see, she, uh, she keeps imagining that she sees murder. She tells people about them, and they're inclined to believe her, and... Well, it, it is very embarrassing. I can imagine. Oh, she's uh, told you, of course. She has, and I'm inclined to believe her, Miss Rosalie. Particularly when she mentions a stabbing in your place. Oh, really, now, I'll just have to take her home if you don't mind. I definitely do mind. Because your little gag won't work, Miss Rosalie. I don't have to stand for this, you know. Miss Rosalie, when you came to the door, you knew my name. Even though I wasn't introduced when Lieutenant Rankin and I were at your place earlier. But I... But nothing. I perched on your fire escape. I heard you and Will Stanley talking about this girl. So that's what happened. Yes, that's what happened. And you and your partner guessed it. That's why you're here, pretending to be her cousin. You want to get her out of here, so he can kill her. I'm leaving. No, you're not. You're staying. There's a certain police lieutenant who wants to chat with you, baby. Look, I... I Just stand I... still, Mr. Granger. It's the man in the gray hat. Yes, my dear. You gave me quite a chase. You're a smart character, Stanek. You got in here and hid in the kitchen, right? Right. And before you make the mistake of reaching for that gun, I'll take it. <laughs> there we are. Wow. Nice little party I'm having tonight. Even if two of the guests are uninvited. Quiet. Hannah, get the girl out of here. My car is around the corner on the side street. Now hurry. You're quite an organizer, Stanek. Go on, Hannah, hurry. Have you a gun? Yeah. Good. If she makes any noise or tries to attract attention, you know what to do. Yeah. Please, Granger, no moving around. I don't trust you. Thanks. I didn't think you would. You won't be long, Will. Not more than a few moments. Drive around the front. The police don't know my car. Very well. Come on, Miss. Stanton. Mr. Granger. Go with her, baby. Well, this makes it just you and me, huh, Stanley? Yeah, and I haven't got much time. Would you stand over there? Yeah. I'd be glad to. Now let go. You wouldn't shoot. And you know it wouldn't. Can I? Oh. I don't think so. Now for Hannah Rosalie. Okay, Miss Rosalie, up with it. Hey, what goes? I think you'll find that Miss Rosalie is indisposed, Mr. Granger. What? 
The blackjack, you know. As you suggested, I hit her over the head. Well, friends, that's the story. I'll be back to wrap up the case in just a minute. Home on. About the time we got Hannah Rosalie and Will Stanek tied up, Lieutenant Rankin showed. Indications were that both of them would go up on murder wraps for the killing of their unnamed partner. Rankin phoned for transportation, after which we went downstairs once more. And just wanted to see in what name this car is registered. I think you'll find it quite legal, Lieutenant. Oh, you do, do you? Uh, I guess you're right. It belongs to Will Stanek, all right. You know, Granger, you did a good job. Oh, I better thank Miss Benton here. She did most of the work, including the spotting of the murder. Holy smoke! I forgot. You got what? The body. We haven't got a corpus delicti. We haven't? Well, just come with me, Lieutenant. There you are, Lieutenant. In the trunk compartment. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. But, Lieutenant, that's what I always thought you were. Steve Granger again. You've just heard one of the most interesting cases in my files. And I'll have another one for you. So be around next time. This is the last show, and it is called Fat Man, and the episode is Murder Sends a Christmas Card. There he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scales. Weight, 239 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. In this business of solving crimes, the detective runs into two types of criminals. The old-time pro and the first offender. The old-timer with his record, fingerprints, and well-known pattern of procedure is always at a disadvantage. And by hard work and the help of a stool pigeon or so, he is usually caught. Your amateur, on the other hand, becomes the detective's $64 question. He has no record, no pattern, and is unknown in the underworld. That makes it real tough, because you've got to work in the dark. And believe me, that's not fun. Especially when you're dealing with a murderer. And now, here's the fat man in Murder Sends a Christmas Card. It must have been about 5.30 on a cold, snowy afternoon when I saw this girl come out of Kelly's pool hall on Carter Street. She wasn't exactly what you'd call beautiful, but she was nice looking. Slim, neatly dressed, and certainly not the type of girl who hangs out in pool halls. She stood on the sidewalk for a second, as if undecided where to go, and then started across the street. Maybe she didn't hear the car coming, or maybe she didn't care. The driver tried to stop, but the streets were slick. I took four running steps, and I dived. Oh. It was a good tackle, and the snow eased our fall and helped us slide clear just as the car skidded by. Oh, I... I didn't hear it. Didn't I... your mother ever tell you to look up and down before you cross the street? You're a lucky lady. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. I... I must have been thinking of something else. I, I just didn't hear the car. Here, let me help you up. Are you all right? Oh, yes, I think so. Oh, oh, my ankle. Is it sprained? No, I don't really think so. I must have turned it. I, I'll be all right. Thank you very much. I, oh. Now, take it easy. You're not going to get very far on that ankle. No, please, I, I must get home. I... I left my little boy with a neighbor. I must get back. Okay, I'll take you home. Here, lean on my arm. No, no, please. I, I live a long way from here. Sam goes to that pool room because it's near where he works. Uh-huh. But uh, let me get a cab and take you home. No, no, I... Sam wouldn't like it. Who's Sam? Your little boy? No, my husband. 
That's why I came out. I, I was looking for him. Is that why you went in the pool room? Uh, yes, I, I thought he might be inside. Sometimes he does go there. Oh, I'm so worried. Why, is he out of work? No, he, he has a job. Not a very good one, but he is working. Then why did you think he'd be in the pool room? Well, this is his day off, but... Oh, that isn't the reason that I... You're not making much sense. You didn't get that worried look just because your husband might be playing pool with the boys on his day off. Now, don't misunderstand, but I'm just trying to be helpful. I suppose I'm being silly, but I was worried. I, I was afraid... Afraid of what? No, it's nothing. I have no right to burden you with my trouble. Maybe talking will make it easier. Oh, you are very kind. My name's Myra Davis. Well, my husband's job doesn't pay much, just enough for us to get along on, and well, Sam gets discouraged. He feels he can give us the things that we need. That's always tough, but it's really nothing to worry so about. Well, that isn't why I'm so worried. This morning it all came to a head. Sam lost his temper, we had an argument, and he left. He said he was going out to get some money. Funny look on his face when he went out, and when he came back this afternoon, I, I got worried. I, I was afraid. That he might get in trouble. Yes, I, I thought he might do something wrong. I. Oh, don't you see? Sure, sure, I see. But while we're talking, I'm going to take you home. And who knows? Maybe I can help Sam get a better job. Hey, taxi! <laughs> The Davises lived nearly two miles from the neighborhood of the pool hall. The apartment wasn't exactly what you'd call classy, but it was neat and clean. Just as we opened the door, the telephone rang. Hello? 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 They hung up. Oh, well, maybe it was Sam. Maybe... Maybe he found a better job. Maybe. I hope so. But why would he call? Why wouldn't he come home and tell me? Now, don't get upset again. You'd better go get your little boy. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Are you sure your ankle's okay now? Yes, it's much better now. In that case, I'll be running along. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Runyon. I do hope you can help, Sam. Well, I'll do all I can. In the meantime, you cheer up. Uh, take this card of mine. Give it to Sam and tell him to drop in and see me tomorrow. Maybe I can help him. Oh, thank you so much. Skip it, sweetheart. I'm an old boy scout. This is my good deed for today. There really wasn't any reason why I should have been worrying about this guy, Sam Davis, and his wife, Myra. He was probably a nice young fella, down in his luck and bitter. Maybe he was headed for trouble because of it, but, well, it wasn't any of my business. Besides, it was time for dinner, and I was hungry. It was cold and snowy outside, but I couldn't get them out of my mind. Maybe I was a sap, but I got a cab and rode all the way back to Kelly's bar and pool room. It was snowing harder than ever when I walked in. Oh. Yeah, what'll it be, mister? Give me a beer. By the way, do you know a fellow named Sam Davis? Yeah, sure, I know Sam. Has he been in here this afternoon? You a friend of his? Yeah. Here you are. Yeah, Sam was in a little while ago. How long ago? Oh, well, let's see. It was after his wife was here looking for him. Uh, she come in about an hour and a half ago, but Sam wasn't here then. He come in soon after she left. I remember because I gave him the message that she was looking for him. Oh, then he went home. No. He went to the phone booth over there to call her. Said he'd got himself a job tonight, so he'd be late getting home. I thought he had a job. He has, but uh, he's going to pick up a little Christmas money by driving a truck or something for the guys he was with. He said it would pay good. Uh, but them guys didn't look exactly like trucking magnets to me, though. How do you mean? Oh, nothing except... Uh, well, since you're a friend of Sam's, just between you and I, uh, they didn't look like Sam's type. Uh, know what I mean? Yeah, I was afraid of that. You didn't know the guys he was with. No, but uh, I get the idea Sam owed one of them some money. Uh, they sat back there and talked for a while. 
I think they was arguing with Sam. Finally, they get up and all of them left. How long ago was that? Oh, not long. Uh, maybe five minutes before you come in. Okay, thanks. See you again. Merry Christmas. I left the pool room and walked east toward the subway six blocks away. It was getting colder. The street was one of those extra-wide warehouse line streets, dark, and deserted except for a small cigar store a few feet ahead of me. There was a telephone booth inside. I went in and dialed Davis's number. Hello? This is Brad Runyon, Mrs. Davis. Has Sam come home yet? Oh, no. No, he hasn't, Mr. Runyon. I, I do wish he would. Well, now, don't worry. I had an idea for Sam, but I'll tell him tomorrow. Oh, you're very kind. And don't worry. Sam will probably be along in a little while. Goodbye now. I went back out into the dark, snow-covered street and tried to forget about Sam Davis. I was four long blocks from the subway when a truck skidded around the corner a block ahead and rolled to a stop in front of a warehouse on the far side of the street. The door of the truck opened and three men got out. They seemed to be in a hurry. One of the men unlocked a small door beside the big rolling one used for trucks and the three went inside. I walked ten yards farther towards the subway and the rolling door of the warehouse went up with a bang. I saw the flash of a gun in the black open pit of the warehouse. I jumped sideways into a doorway and pressed against the wall. Two men ran suddenly out of the warehouse. One was bareheaded and the other wore a cap. They both had guns in their hands. A third staggered behind them and toppled headlong on the snow-covered walk. The guy wearing the cap stopped when his pal fell to the walk. But the first man ran to the truck and drove off. The guy with the cap on tried to make the truck, but it was too late. Just then, a cop came running down the street, and a guy still on his feet started to run. He forgot how slippery the street was, but it saved his life. His feet slid out from under him, just as the cop fired and the bullet hit a window. Maybe he thought he'd hit the gunman. Anyway, he waited a split second too long before trying to fire again. The man in the cap turned over while he was still sliding along in the snow. He only fired once. The cop's arm flew up over his head. He fell forward on his face. I grabbed my gun and moved quickly out into the street, but the man in the cap was already nearing the corner of the next block. It was too dark and I missed. By the time I reached the corner, he was gone. I tried to follow his footprints in the snow, but he'd gone into the street and I lost him in the slush. So I went back to the warehouse. Evidently, nobody else had heard the shots. The cop and the third gunner were still where they'd fallen. There was a police call box next to the small door of the warehouse. I opened it and asked Lieutenant McKenzie of police headquarters. Lieutenant McKenzie speaking. This is Runyon, Mac. Ah, hello, Brian. I thought this call was from one of my men. The cop who ought to be making this call is lying in the gutter across the street. What's happened? A holdup that went sour. There's a gunman on the sidewalk and a watchman inside, both carrying lead. Two of the stick-up boys got away. You'd better get down here with an ambulance and a prowl car. Where are you? Colby Street, about three blocks from the river. Okay. I closed the call box. My eyes traveled back along the sidewalk where the man on the cap had slipped in the snow and done his fancy shooting. Something bright and shiny caught my eye. It was lying on the sidewalk where the snow had been scraped away by the man's fall went over and picked it up. It was a chromium-plated cigarette lighter. And it obviously had fallen from a man's pocket when he went down. I struck a match and looked closer at it. There was engraving on the back that said, To Sam with love from Myra. I put the lighter in my pocket, then crossed the street. Hugging the shadows and walking fast, I went back to the cigar store two blocks away. The proprietor dozed behind the counter and a radio was playing. That's why he hadn't heard the shooting. I looked at my wristwatch. Twenty minutes of eight. Less than ten minutes had passed since I'd left the telephone booth. I closed the booth door and dialed Sam Davis's number for the second time that night. Hello? This is Brad Runyon again, Mrs. Davis. Oh, it's all right now, Mr. Runyon. All right? Yes, Sam came home. There wasn't anything to worry about at all. He, he thought that he might have a job tonight, but he turned it down and came home. He turned it down? Yes. I talked to you less than ten minutes ago, Mrs. Davis. Sam hadn't come in then. Oh, no, no, I know that. He came in right after I talked to you. Put him on the phone a minute. I want to talk with him. 
Oh, he's not here now. Where is he? You mean he came in ten minutes ago and has left again? Yes. Why, what is it, Mr. Runyon? What's wrong? Did he say where he was going? No. He had a phone call that seemed to upset him. And when I told him about you, how you promised to get him a better job, he's, he seemed to feel better. He put his cap on. Now, wait a minute. Did you say cap? I... Well, yes, Sam always wears a cap. He told me not to worry, that he had to settle something, that he'd be back again in a little while. Then he left there just a minute ago. Well, he just got out of the door and your call came. I see. Oh, what's wrong, Mr. Runyon? Tell me the truth, Mrs. Davis. It's important. Truth? But I am telling you the truth. Sam didn't come home, did he? You got a phone call from him five minutes ago. No, no, he didn't call. He was here. He's only just left. He called and he told you to say he'd been there. No, no, he was here. I swear he was. What is it? What's happened? I'm sorry, Mrs. Davis, but there's been a murder. Matt! Oh, no, no! The man who did the shooting was wearing a cap when he dropped a cigarette lighter with the engraving to Sam with love from Myra on it. You gave Sam that lighter, didn't you? Oh, yes. Yes, but he was here, I tell you. He couldn't have been there. Your apartment is two miles from here. Stepped out of the cigar store, two prowl cars and an ambulance stood in front of the warehouse. Four cops stood around in the glare of a searchlight. I should have gone up and joined them, but I didn't. Somehow, I wasn't quite sure. There was the lighter, the man in the cap, Myra's scared, flustered voice. It should have added up, but somehow it didn't. Maybe it was because I didn't want it to. I headed back to Kelly's pool room. As I walked, I brought out Davis's lighter and looked at it. I realized I was holding more than just a lighter in my hand. I was holding a man's life and a woman's happiness. That's a lot to hold in your hands. I quit thinking about it and remembered that I was a licensed detective. As I entered Kelly's, the bartender glanced up and nodded. I took a seat where I could watch the door and also the game of pool. The clock above the bar said a quarter to eight. The door to the street opened and a man wearing a cap came in. He was young, not more than 25 or 6. Slim, about 5 feet 10, neatly dressed and rather good looking. He looked round the room as if he were searching for somebody. Then he reached in his pocket and took out a pack of cigarettes. From force of habit, his hand reached toward the pocket for a match or lighter and stopped as if he remembered. I knew it was Sam Davis. He turned to the bartender and walked toward him. I took the lighter from my pocket and followed him across the floor. Got a match, Joe? Oh, hello, Sam. Sure. Here you are, keep him. Thanks. Uh, never mind the match, Sam. I'll light it for you. Huh? Here you are. Why, thanks, sir. Where did you get that light? I thought you might be interested. Who are you? Never mind that. I want to talk to you. Talk to me? What about? Is there a room around here, Joe, where we can have a private talk? Yeah, right back there beyond the tables. It's the boss's office, but he ain't in tonight. Nobody with any brains will be working tonight. I ain't got no brains. Come on, Sam. It ain't locked. Just go right in. Okay. Okay, mister. What's the pitch? Sit down. <sighs> Who are you and 
Where did you get that lighter? I found the lighter where you dropped it tonight. Where I dropped it? I didn't drop it. It's no good, Sam. The cop died. The cop died? Hey, what are you talking about? Where were you at 7.30 tonight? I was home. I can prove it by my wife. I've already talked to your wife. She can't prove anything. But she saw me. She can tell you. She's your wife, Sam. She loves you. You shouldn't have let her down like that. And listen, you got to believe me. I don't know who you are or what you're talking about. You, you said a cop died. I don't know nothing about it. I, I didn't go with him. I swear I didn't. So you didn't go with him, eh? What, what I mean is I, I don't... That know. doesn't sound like you don't know anything about it. Who are you? Are you a cop? I'm Brad Runyon. The fat man? That's right. Myra told me about you just a little while ago. When you called her on the phone? I didn't call her. I went home. I left there about 25 minutes ago. Why did you go out again so soon, then? I... Well, I, I, I know it'll sound screwy. It all sounds screwy, but there was something I had to attend to. Something I had to explain. Something like shooting a cop? No, 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 no. I tell you, I, I didn't shoot anybody. Now, listen to me. you got to believe me. you you got to tell me... That lighter of mine, where did it come from? I saw the stick-up tonight. I was standing in a doorway across the street. The man who shot the cop was wearing a cap like yours. He was your size, and he dropped this lighter when he slipped in the snow. It wasn't me. I swear it wasn't, Runyon. I didn't even know Keep that... talking. I'd like to believe you, Sam. I liked your wife. I heard about that kid of yours. Now, listen, Runyon, I don't know what your angle is in this or why you're interested, but it looks like I'm in a jam. A big jam. Now, look, I'll, I'll come clean with you if, if, if you'll help me. Keep talking. Well, the job I've got's no good, see? I don't make any dough. It, it's hardly enough to get along. Well, I, I watched the bills pile up and Christmas was coming. Other guys give their wife and kids nice presents. I couldn't. I know all that. What happened tonight? Well, there were some guys. I met them a couple of days ago. Got in a pool game with them, one of them. I thought I'd win a little money, but instead I lost. I couldn't pay, so I gave this guy my lighter. You've got to do better than that, Sam. But it's the truth. That was two days ago. You said something about going with them tonight. I'm coming to that. Now, you've you got to believe this. This afternoon, I ran into them again. They, they said that they, they had a job I could do. What was the job? I was driving a truck for them. They offered me a hundred bucks. Well, That's a lot of money for driving a truck. Well, not for this kind of driving, and I needed the money. But I've never been in trouble, so I, I backed out. I went home instead. About five minutes after I got home, a call came from one of the guys. He told me to meet him here right away, so I left and came back. It's not so good, Sam. It's true, I tell you, all of it. You don't believe it, do you? Can you prove you went home, Sam? I mean by anybody else other than your wife. Why, why no, I, I, I didn't see anybody. But I did go home, I swear it, Runyon. Hey, what are you going to do? Keep sitting down, Sam, this gun's loaded. Now, wait, Runyon, who are you calling? Please. No, no, don't do it. Please, don't you see? Shut I... up. Get me Lieutenant McKenzie. Tell him Brad Runyon is calling. Now, give me a break. I, I know it looks bad, but there must be some way I can prove I'm telling the truth. That's, that's the way guys get railroaded, don't you see? All I... I can see, Sam, is that there's been a murder. Maybe you were real... Hello. Hello, Mac. Never mind where I've been. I'm in Kelly's pool hall on the corner of Carter and Calvi Street, and I think I've got something for you in connection with the killing of the cop tonight. I'll explain when you get here, so hurry. You're not going to railroad me, not if I... <laughs> that was a mistake, Sam. <laughs> a slight cut on the side of his mouth where my fist had connected. Otherwise, he was okay. But something had fallen out of his pocket. A small white card. I bent over, 
picked the card up and looked at it. It read, Brad Runyon, Private Investigator. It was the same card I'd given his wife when I took her home. He had been home. I looked at my watch. Mackenzie wouldn't waste any time. Sam Davis was headed for the chair unless I acted fast. They'd never believe the story of the card. I slipped it in my pocket. There was a water cooler in the corner. I filled a paper cup and threw it in Sam's face. Come on, Sam. Come on, wake up. Uh, uh, what, what happened? I hit you. Come on, get up. I, I told you the truth, Runyon. I swear it. I... Skip it, skip it. Now listen to me, Sam. We haven't got much time. Nobody's going to railroad you. What do you mean? You just Let called Let me them. talk. We've got to act fast. The cops will be here any minute. Yeah, but wait a second. I don't understand. I said, you... listen. If you love that wife and kid of yours, you'll do exactly what I tell you. Understand? Why did you... Never mind that. Now hit me. Hit you. That's what I said. Hit me as hard as you can right here on the jaw. Then open that window back there and wait for me to come to. And don't leave here. Whatever you do, stay. Now come on and hit me. But I don't get it. I'm not joking. Listen, it. Sam, so help me. If you don't do what I tell you, I'll slug you again. Now hit me. Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. He was good. The fist exploded in my face, and I went out like a light. I don't know how long I was unconscious, and at first I couldn't remember where I was when I started snapping out of it. The back of my head ached, and my jaw felt like a flat iron had hit it. Gradually, a blurred face began making sense in front of my eyes. It was Mackenzie. Brad. Brad, are you okay? Oh. Hello, Mac. Whoa, yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, no, don't worry, Brad. I got him. He was still here when I came in. You got him? Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, there he is over there with the handcuffs on. Huh? There. So he's in on a hold-up, huh? Oh, hold it, Mac. That's not the guy. Huh? Hey, what are you talking about? He was standing here right over you when I came in. I said he's not the murderer. But who is? Well, I guess he got away after slugging me. Maybe he went out through the window back there. Uh, you must be slipping, Brad. It couldn't be that you're getting soft, could it? What about this guy here? Who's he? Oh, he's a friend of mine named Sam Davis. He was outside and must have come in to help when he heard the row. I guess he got slugged, too. Look at his jaw. Yeah. Hey, golly, the mark on his jaw is almost good enough to be one of yours, Brad. Yeah. So you know this kid, huh? Yeah, he's a truck driver. Works for the Hinkle Company. Take the cuffs off him, Mac. And by the way, Sam, don't forget to drop in my office. I think I can fix you up with a better job. I'll be there. And thanks a lot for everything. Scabbard. Come on, Mac. I can't get over you letting that guy slug you and get away. Don't worry about it. My friend Sam Davis and I will get him and the rest of the gang. Hey, what's going on? It's okay. Go on back to your game. Hey, what's Well, it turned out to be a nice night after all, Mac. Yeah, it's pretty cold, but it stopped snowing. Well, I got to get back to headquarters. I'll walk along with you. Hey, Brad, I don't get it. This is the first time in all the years I've known you that you ever let anybody clip you and get away with it. Somebody's going to pay for it. I'll give you those guys for Christmas presents. Well, that sounds good, but how? With a card, Mac. A card? What are you talking Listen. about? Listen. Hear that? Sure, Christmas bells. But what about this card? What kind of a card? Let's call it a Christmas card, Mac. My own. And the best one I ever gave in my life. <laughs> That's that. 
It seems I spend my life getting into trouble and getting out of it. But at the same time, I generally manage to get some other people in and out of trouble, too. Be seeing you again. So long. <laughs>